two men two philosophies two choices one decision you decide Hello, my name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years, and now since 1989, I've been an evangelist doing seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. What you're about to watch is a debate that we taped many years ago. Uh, sorry about the poor quality in some areas, but I think the message is very fascinating. I do many debates at universities. I'm very willing to do more. We just recently began posting a list on our website of professors who have refused to debate me. I've had 60-some debates. If you talk to a professor who believes in evolution, Try to ask them if they'd be willing to debate against a creationist. I'd be honored to do that. I'll be very nice to them, but I'll show them they're wrong and God's word is right. Um, and we, if they refuse, then please send me their name and what they teach, and we'll put them on our list on our website, drdino.com, under, uh, under the section of those who have refused to debate me. This will be a long debate with me talking to an anthropology class at the University of West Florida. One of the professors from the class used to ask me to come teach his class every year for one hour or for one class period. He then moved on, and I haven't been back to that class for a while, but I'd be glad to come speak to any class, university, uh, college, uh, Christian or non-Christian, and field questions from the audience. We can talk about the subject of creation evolution. Hope you enjoy this uh, uh, debate. We have quite a few more. If this is the only one you've seen, we suggest you get our catalog. You can call the office or write or uh, get on our website, and that information will come up on screen, and you can uh, get information about how to get more debates or our other series of tapes. We have a lot of information designed to strengthen your faith in the Word of God. We encourage people to believe the Bible and do what it says and accept Christ as their Savior uh, so they don't die and go to hell. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please give us a call. Thank you for coming for the second year in a row. And thank you, Dr. Lee, for having me. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Good All right. It's good to be here. My name is Kent Hovind. I live here in Pensacola. I uh, moved here five years ago to put my wife through school at Pensacola Christian College. I have three teenagers. They go to Pensacola Christian High School. Um, I was a science teacher 15 years and now travel around and speak full-time on this subject, creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. That's my full-time ministry. I speak over 700 times a year. I'm an old-fashioned Bible-believing Christian. I believe the Bible is literally true from cover to cover. And with my science background, it puts a little different slant on things. And so what we're going to share with you today, of course, is the creationist view of how the world got here and some of the things that you've been taught in anthropology class, I would say, of course, are very, very wrong. But it's good to have scientific discussions like this. That's the purpose of an education. See, if you're only shown one side of an issue, you're not being educated, you're being indoctrinated. So an education shows people all the various sides and lets them use their own intellect and decide which one is the most reasonable. I hold, without apology, to the creationist worldview that this world is too complex. It had to be created by an all-wise, all-powerful creator who is outside of and beyond and above and not affected by his creation. There are really only two opposing worldviews. There is the worldview of evolution. I'm going to draw it like so, and I'm going to make three columns to, uh, for this discussion here. We'll take questions all along the way. You can stop me at any time, say, no, wait a minute, I disagree with that, and we'll discuss it. And Dr. Lee introduced me as the leading expert. I don't know about that. I was just a high school science teacher. But uh, I do have uh, plenty of opportunities to speak on this. I do numerous debates uh, at universities. I've had three here so far at University of West Florida. And I appreciate the academic uh, atmosphere where they allow me to come in. Uh, I speak many times in public schools. I was in six this week already. I speak very frequently in public schools. And I think students need to see all sides of this issue. What we've had for the last 30 years, particularly though, is the creationist worldview has been totally censored out of our textbooks. I collect the public school textbooks. I have just nearly all of them from science textbooks from all the major publishers for many years. And the evolutionist frame of mind or worldview is the only one that is promoted in the textbooks. Now, of course, we have many teachers who treat the subject very fairly, but the textbooks have become increasingly one-sided. We're going to make three columns. There are some facts. And then there are different ways to interpret the fact. Sometimes two people can look at the very same thing and come to opposite conclusions of what they're seeing. The story is told about the uh, farmer 
was out pulling a calf one time. Anybody raised on a farm here? Any farm kids? A calf puller is a long pole with a block and tackle on it or a come along on it. And in case the cow has a hard time having a calf, you hook a rope around the calf's leg and you <coughs> winch it out of the cow. Help the cow out a little bit. Well, this farmer was out there pulling a calf and this city fella stopped to, to stop his car to see what's going on. He'd never seen anything like this before in his life. And the farmer said, come here, man, give me some help, would you? And the city fella said, me? He said, yeah, come here. He said, I don't know nothing about this. He said, come on, I need some help now. So the city fellow hopped out of his car, jumped the fence, ran over there and helped the farmer pull the calf. Never said a word. Just did what the farmer told him. You know, hold this, pull this. About 10 minutes later, they're walking up to the barn to get washed up. And the uh, city fellow said, uh, or the far farmer said, man, you've been awful quiet. Are you okay? He said, oh yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. The farmer said, uh, have you ever seen anything like this before? The city fellow said, no, sir, I've never seen anything like this before in my life. And the farmer said, well, you got any questions? He said, oh, yes, I do. I have one question been bugging me the whole time we're out there. The farmer said, uh, let's hear it. The city fellow said, uh, how fast do you think that the calf was going when it ran into that cow? <laughs> no, no, you're looking at it all wrong. We are not separating the collision here. Uh, see, two people can look at the same thing and come to very opposite conclusions. we will give you an example. It's a fact. Grand Canyon exists. I don't think you'd find too many folks that would disagree with that. Of course, there's always a few on the lunatic fringe who would say, no, we're not really here. We just think we're here. There is no such thing as reality, okay? We're going to discount those folks for today's discussion. There are really only two options, okay, to a lot of these questions we're going to raise today. Grand Canyon is there. It's a big crack in the ground. I have seen it from numerous angles. There is no question it's there. Now, there are several ways to interpret how it got there. The evolutionist interpretation The evolutionist interpretation says it took a little bit of water millions of years. That's called uniformitarian geology. How many are familiar with that word, uniformitarian? The way it's happening today is the way it has always happened. Charles Lyell was the champion of uniformitarianism back in his book, 1831, Principles of Geology, Volume 1. Charles Lyell really taught and introduced into the public arena the idea of uniformitarianism. There is another worldview which is the creationist worldview. The creationist worldview says it took a lot of water, a little bit of time, <coughs> lots of water, a short time. You see, while the mud was soft, and Grand Canyon is obviously all composed of sedimentary rock, so it was all sedimentary rock mud at one time before it turned to rock, as nobody would argue that question. That's how sedimentary rock is formed. The creationist would say a lot of water formed Grand Canyon in just a matter of a few hours or a few days, not millions of years. The fact is the canyon is there. Now, how are you going to interpret that fact? Some people tend to confuse the interpretation with the fact, and that's where you have to really watch that you don't get caught in that trap. What we're going to share now is just the creationist worldview opinion of how it may have happened. None of us were there. That's obvious. So we have to then go on the facts that we can find and try to interpret, make up a model that'll work, and say, okay, this is maybe how it happened. The creationist worldview. I believe that the world is only six to seven, maybe 10,000 years old maximum. It cannot be any older than that. I'm gonna say six to 10,000. So I'm gonna draw a timeline. Right here is the present. We're gonna call it the year 2000, since we're getting close to that, just for the sake of marking it off in thousands. We go back to the year zero, where we figure our calendar from when Christ was born. Actually, our calendar is a few years off. I'm familiar with all that Gregorian calendar and everything. And then we go back to B.C., times before Christ. We have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 B.C., 4,000 years before Christ. According to the dates given in the Bible, if you add up the dates given in the Bible, Adam was 130 when Seth was born, and Seth was 105 when Enos was born, and the dates are all spelled out in Genesis chapter 5 and in chapter 11 and in several other places throughout Scripture. The dates are given of how old they were when their children were born. Adding up those dates will give an approximate age of the creation of the world of about 4,000 B.C., plus or minus several hundred, maybe 500 or so allowances for genealogy um, overlapping and things like that. If the, we're we're going to use the word 4,000, but don't hold me to that, okay? I'm not one of those guys that says Adam was created 4,004 B.C., October 23rd at 2 in the afternoon, okay? I, knew, I do know Adam was created in the afternoon because it was just before Eve. That's the only clue we have in Scripture. But it doesn't give the exact date, all right? So we're going to, about 4,000 years ago. Then the Bible says, 1,600 years later, 
there was a worldwide flood, a flood that destroyed the world. This took place about 1,600 years after the creation. Actually, 1656, if the date's given, are exactly correct. After this flood, there were only eight survivors, eight people on board that ark. Those eight people began producing a population. They had lived, they lived longer, so they had more children, maybe 10 or 15 kids per family. Population began to grow pretty rapidly. And by the time you got to the year zero, the time of Jesus Christ, the world population, and anybody would agree with this that studied the population statistics of the world, the world population was approximately one-fourth of a billion. One quarter billion, 250 million, is the approximate world population at the time of Christ. You can go upstairs to your library or to the next building over here and get the uh, population statistics, uh, Macmillan Encyclopedia, or look it up in any one you want that deals with the population issue. Most experts agree the whole world population 2,000 years ago was approximately a quarter billion. 250 million. Then the population began to grow, especially around the 1600s when a lot of new uh, medical advancements came on the scene and a lot of really, really modern science began about the 1600s. That's where there was a great, of course, revival in reading the Bible. The King James Version was translated and many versions were put into the English language or into the common people's language where people could read it for themselves. And I think that was one of the great causes of the great revival of interest in learning and knowledge. And along with that came some tremendous medical advancements and scientific advancements and technology advancements. And so people began living longer, producing more children, and children lived longer. And the, about 1600 is when the population began to skyrocket. 1800, there were one billion people in the world. In 1800, we crossed the one billion mark. In 1930, it crossed the two billion mark, 1930. Today it's up over five billion, but really all of the population growth has come in the last couple of hundred years. So it is very possible that the whole world's population started 4,400 years ago with eight people. Anybody familiar with population growth rates, logarithmic extrapolation could tell you, yes, the whole world's population, six billion, could have easily started only four or 5,000 years ago. Now the evolutionist interpretation of, it's a fact, we have about, I'm gonna say five and a half billion people in the world. We'll put that in the fact column. Nobody argues with that. I mean, that's not an exact number, but it's close enough. Well, how do you interpret that? The evolutionist says the population stayed at 50,000 or so for many, many, many thousands of years, several million years. There were just a few thousand people in the world, or subhumans. And then they would agree from about the time, about 1,000 BC on, they would agree with the population growth curve that the creationist would give to it. These are established facts. But the evolutionist has this line going along at 30 or 40, 50,000 for 3 million years. And populations simply don't grow like that. They're just an automatic blast off, just like putting money in the bank. Once you reach a certain number of dollars in the bank, the compounded interest starts to take over. So the creationist interpretation is no problem. The fact that we have five and a half billion really fits fine into the biblical chronology of starting 4,400 years ago with eight people getting off an ark. The evolutionist would also say no problem, but he would have to say that this population was steady for millions of years. So if you look at the facts, neither one it can be discounted based on the fact that we have a population. If you're willing to admit a worldwide flood in Noah's day, then the formation of Grand Canyon and Carlsbad Caverns and the Snake River Valley and all those canyon formations are really no problem for the creationist. Somebody, if a teacher says, well, millions of years ago, the first question ought to come into your mind is, uh, excuse me, were you there? You know, do you know it's millions or billions of years old? Time is something, I mean, it's gone, okay? It's historical. We can't really have scientific data. We must have historical <laughs> data. And it becomes a very different way to interpret it. I believe when God created the heavens and the earth, everything, about six or 7,000 years ago, everything was very perfect. Perfect world, completely done. Poof, he spoke and it was done in six literal 24-hour days. And during that time, everything lived together, including the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs lived with man. They were just big, friendly lizards in the Garden of Eden. See, the unusual thing about lizards, if you've had your biology classes, you know that lizards and many reptiles never stop growing. They never stop. When I moved into my house across the street from Pensacola Christian High School two years ago, I was going around meeting all my neighbors, knocking on doors, finding out who the neighbors were, and like everybody ought to do in the neighborhood, be friendly, you know. And I knocked on this house six doors down from my house, and the guy said, come on in. Well, I walked in, and there, crawling around loose on his kitchen floor right in front of me, was a five-foot-long iguana. This guy raises iguanas for pet stores, five foot long. I stopped, held perfectly still. I said, does it bite? He said, no, no, we just fed it. 
I said, how big is that thing going to get? He said, it's an iguana, man. They never stop growing. He said, I've raised them 10 feet long before. Lizards never stop growing. So the creationist would say, dinosaurs lived in the pre-flood era for about 1,600 years. They were just simply giant lizards. The Bible teaches, and of course it's not scientifically provable because it's gone now, the Bible teaches that the original earth, when God first made it, had a canopy of water above the atmosphere. The air that we're breathing today has about six layers to it, troposphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere, ionosphere. There used to be a seventh layer, according to scripture. The seventh layer was a layer of water above the atmosphere, made some kind of cloud cover. Venus has a dense cloud cover. Jupiter has a dense cloud cover. The earth apparently had a dense, I don't know about dense, but had some kind of water above the atmosphere, which would do several things. It would filter out the <coughs> harmful effects of the sun. Most of the aging process is caused by the sun especially ultraviolet light and uh, x-rays that are destroying your body and your body has to constantly battle against those damaging effects of the sunlight. The original creation did not have that. According to scripture, they were protected by a canopy of water, which many creationists think would have increased air pressure. It's interesting, some of the articles out now about what happened to the dinosaurs. Uh, International Falls, Minnesota, the Daily Journal, new theory, lack of oxygen killed the dinosaurs from the Boston Associated Press. Studies of dinosaurs indicate they had very small lungs compared to their body size. Also, they had very small nostrils. The nostrils of a Brachiosaurus were about the same size as those in a horse. So how's a critter that big, 150 feet now is the world's record, how's he going to get enough oxygen to survive? Well, in today's atmosphere, a 150 foot dinosaur could not survive. He couldn't get enough oxygen to maintain body metabolism. But if the pre-flood scenario is correct, that before the flood there was a canopy of water, this would increase air pressure, meaning every time you take a breath, you get twice the oxygen. Not only that, the pre-flood world apparently had richer oxygen to begin with. They drill into the ancient uh, samples of amber and find air bubbles in there. Trapped amber, or amber that traps air bubbles, when you analyze the air bubbles, this is from Time Magazine, 1987, page 82, also, Science Magazine, 1987, November, page 890, tells about the sampling of the air found in amber. It indicates 50% more oxygen than we had today. So instead of 20% oxygen, they had 30% oxygen. Well, these are a couple of scientific facts that really would fit fine with the creationist worldview. The original Earth had a little richer oxygen and higher pressure. The strange thing about high pressure gases is when you take a breath, you get twice the oxygen per lungful, and your healing process is much faster. Many major hospitals today are putting in what's called hyperbaric chambers. Little Jessica McClure, the girl in Texas that fell down in the well, remember that, 1987? Her foot was twisted around and stuck in her face as she was down inside of a 12-inch pipe for over two days, 58 and a half hours. When they got her out, her foot was completely black and part of her leg was black from lack of circulation. They were gonna cut her foot off, but one of the doctors suggested that they try her in a hyperbaric chamber. They put Jessica in a big steel chamber, pumped it up full of pure oxygen, and put it up to 30 pounds per square inch. Today you're breathing about 14.7 pounds per square inch atmospheric pressure. At 30 pounds per square inch, Jessica's foot began to turn pink within a few hours. It forced oxygen into the tissue. And they finally had to cut off the tip of her little toe. That's the only thing that wouldn't respond. She would have lost her whole foot. And many major hospitals are getting these hyperbaric chambers because they are learning that high pressure oxygen causes the healing process to go many times faster than normal. A lot of burn patients are put in hyperbaric chambers these days because they heal so much faster. The Bible account would indicate that the whole world had these conditions. And so in pre-flood conditions, the people actually lived over 900 years. And there are many accounts besides the Bible, many ancient accounts in literature that tell of a time when ancient people lived many, many hundreds of years. And that certainly is biologically possible if you could alter not only the atmosphere that you're breathing, but also the plants would be getting more, uh, better growth rate and have more nutrition to the plants. The people apparently, according to scripture at least, lived over 900 years. Here is a chart that I made of the length of the people's lifespans. Adam, for instance, every notch is 100 years here. Adam, according to scripture, lived over 900 years. His son Seth lived over 900 years. Right here, this black line going down is the flood, 1,600 years later. These are straight from the dates given in the Bible. The people before the flood lived over 900 years with one or two exceptions. After the flood, lifespans dropped off to 400 years, and then down to 200 years. 
something changed because of that flood. Well, the creationist worldview would say, this canopy of water fell down. It rained 40 days and 40 nights. It flooded the world. It was a worldwide total catastrophe for this place. Everything was covered. All the mountains simultaneously covered at one time. People say, now wait a minute, wait a minute. Is it possible to flood the world? Is, I mean, could it rain enough to flood the whole world? Well, today, absolutely not. No, no, there's only enough moisture in the atmosphere to rain about two inches. But there's enough water in the ocean to cover this world two miles deep right now. If the world were smoothed out, if you push the mountains down and lift the ocean basins up, if you equalize things, the water would be 12,000 feet deep over the entire world. Well, the Bible indicates that after this flood, or actually during the course of the flood, in the last few months of the flood, the Bible says the mountains arose. The Earth's crust was twilt, uh, crinkling in under the pressures of all this water and the great catastrophe that it was under, and the mountains lifted up and the ocean sank down during the last few months of that flood. As the mountains lifted up, the water would run off into the hole on the way, forming Grand Canyon in a matter of a few hours because you had many, many thousands of feet of soft sediment. During that flood, all sorts of animals drowned and people. Their bodies would then be, those that drowned, some would float and would rot and would not be preserved as fossils because they floated around. Some would happen to get buried. Those animals that are near the bottom already, like clams, would be buried first because they're already at the bottom. If there's a mudslide or volcanoes going on, they would be the first ones buried. The animals like birds and man are the last ones to drown because man could figure out a way to avoid drowning until the last possible minute. And birds, of course, can fly around until they run out of gas. And then when they do die, their wings are hollow and their bones are hollow, so they would float. Then the reason we tend to find birds on top of the so-called geologic column might be better explained because of a worldwide flood. It doesn't necessarily have to be that birds evolve last. There are two ways to interpret that. You know, how fast is that calf going when it ran into that cow? Anyway, you might want to keep track of the idea that maybe there is another very reasonable alternative explanation for some of the data that we see. I'm in favor of science. I love science. I got a PhD in education, which stands for post hole digger, by the way. But I love science. But I'm afraid the evolutionist worldview is only one option. And as you go here to the University of West Florida, that's generally all you're going to be shown in your textbooks. The author of this textbook, as I read the older edition of this, doesn't consider creationism other than to ridicule it. Oh, this is an old-fashioned idea. We proved this wrong 100 years ago. That's the attitude they give about creation. Well, the creationist worldview would say, because of this flood, all of the geologic features were formed. After the flood, the climate was very, very different. The people didn't live as long. And any time you change atmospheric pressure, like that flood would have done, you would have some real changes, really, for the next few hundred years as the globe, uh, Earth began to restabilize. The ice caps were advancing and retreating as things were very unstable ecologically, and the climatology was very different. And so with increased um, weather changing patterns, people began to be deficient in certain diseases. Most of the ancient skulls that you've been shown, like uh, Homo erectus and you know, uh, Neanderthal man, were probably just people who were deficient in certain vitamins. Rickets or uh, different diseases would set in under climate conditions like that where they weren't able to get enough sunshine. And rickets does cause the br a brow ridge to thicken and enlarge, and, uh, enlarge, and it causes the bone structure to be altered. There's a great book out, which you really ought to read. And I tried to order enough for everybody, but they're totally out of print. But if you would like one, I will buy you one if you'll promise to read it. Bones of Contention. This is by a creationist who has studied every single so-called fossil of caveman or ape man and has given a creationist interpretation of that. So if you'd see my son afterwards over there and put your name on the list, I will buy you one if you'll promise to read it. I don't, want, I don't have enough money to buy everybody a book to sit on your shelf. But if you really want an education, you ought to see both sides. If you like what you believe because whatever reason, well, then you may not want to see the other side. But there is an awful lot of evidence that says these so-called cavemen, Neanderthal man, Piltdown man, Java man, Peking man, etc., etc., are either um, misidentified, little fragments, or they are simply deformed humans from certain things. You could line up the skulls of folks in this county in the same sequence that they appear in your anthropology books. There are folks with the same deformations of their skulls. So that, that lining up bones in a certain order does not prove that's the way it evolved. Yes, sir? Why, were, why are the bones that have been found only, quote unquote, sickened bones? Why don't we have a fine array of healthy bones from, the, from these people, too? All right. Here is some charts that I photocopied from this book uh, of the different so-called, like for instance, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, 
and the dates that they were assigned. You got to understand, there is, a, there is a preconceived idea that is very well established called the geologic column, the time scale by the evolutionist. You know, so certain things happen. And it's, a very, it's a preconceived idea. And if a fossil is found, it must fit into that pattern or the time is rejected. Many of the fossils that have been found, have, they have said, well, this is fully human, but it's too old. There's archaic Homo sapien species that don't fit. Pure, 100% normal, natural Homo sapien bones have been found, just like today's bones, in layers that are supposedly 2 million years old. So all sorts of mental gymnastics must be done if you want to preserve the theory, the interpretation. If you're just willing to look at the facts, you would have to say, hey, if, if this bone is 2 million years old, then all these other things don't matter. They can't be human ancestors. And I've got enough of these to pass out to everybody. We'll do this at the end in just a second. Homo erectus, Homo habilis. Uh, I've got, should be another page of these, bud. Oh, here. Um, I thought, yeah, here they are. Okay, two separate ones. Nope, that's something else. Hmm. Can I go check the back of the van and see if there's another set of these things that I photocopied, would you please? Oh. So, I think very few human fossils are found, period. There are probably only 4,000 human fossils or humanoid fossils found in the entire world. That's a reasonable figure. Um, to me, the explanation of that would be, when God first made the world, it was full of animals and full of plants, but only two people. They then had to populate the world, and in 1,600 years, there were only several million, maybe a billion, I don't know, but not near the population we have today. So human bones would be rare for two reasons. Number one, there weren't as many humans as there were animals. Number two, humans are going to figure out a way to avoid drowning until the last minute, which puts them on top and they rot. They're not preserved at all. So the fact that we only have 4,000 or so is no problem for me. Now, how they're dated, well, all that kind of stuff, carbon dating, we'll get into that in just a little bit. After this flood, though, I believe man began killing off the dinosaurs. <coughs> Man well, the climate killed off many of them because climate was different and they couldn't grow as big and live as long. But man began hunting them. And that's why during this era from 4,000 years ago, we have many stories of people killing dragons. There are many legends like that of dragon slayers. The Chinese recipes from the 3,000 years ago call for dragon bones ground up in the recipes, dragon saliva, dragon fat, you know, for all kinds of different so-called recipes or medicines. <coughs> Is it all just mythology? I mean, they were there, we weren't. If you have an evolutionary perspective, a worldview, you have to give all of the so-called dragon stories the interpretation of mythology. If you have a creationist worldview, that would really make sense that dinosaurs may have lived with man for a thousand years or so after the flood. They were getting smaller, they were getting more rare, and they were being hunted to the point of even total extinction in many areas. Then you come up into the present. And there are still many thousands of reports coming out of places around the world of dinosaurs that may still be living. For instance, Loch Ness Monster. There's been hoaxes and frauds, no question, but there have been 11,000 reported sightings of the Loch Ness Monster. And if you show this dinosaur, a plesiosaurus, to anybody who has seen the Loch Ness Monster, they will say, that's it. That's what I saw right there. Well, now, there's no question. Some may be trying to get tourist dollars over there in you know, Scotland and all that. I've not been there. I do have a map of Loch Ness right here from Scotland with some of the pictures that have been taken of the Loch Ness Monster and an underwater topography of the, of the area. The lake is 900 <coughs> to 1,000 feet deep. And there have been some very <coughs> reputable people with nothing to gain but ridicule who have said, I have seen it. So I have spent many years, not out there, but I have spent many years collecting data, believe it or not, on dinosaurs that may still be alive. Now, they're not nearly as big, and they're certainly not anywhere in Pensacola, Florida that I know of. You know, it's not, it's not like they're all over the world. But you really can't prove the extinction of anything. And think about that for a minute. You can't prove anything is extinct because you cannot be all places at all times to examine the whole world simultaneously. There are some who are saying there may be a few dodo birds left on some of these Pacific islands. I don't know that, you know, they haven't been seen in 300 years, but how can you prove there aren't any? So proving extinction is an is impossible thing to do. There are those who are saying that there could be a few dinosaurs still left. If you watch programs like Unsolved Mysteries or Sightings or things like that, you see some awfully bizarre things on there that don't make sense if you have this worldview. Because you've already been taught. Dinosaurs died out 70 million years ago. Don't dare question that or you'll be excommunicated from the temples of higher learning, you know? Yes? Well, I'm detecting a little bit of a straw man here because 
if your this so-called evolutionist view isn't half as solid as you're making it out to be, there's a big argument now whether or not dinosaurs were warm or cold-blooded. And there's no bird fossils at all. There's only three Archaeopteryx fossils in the whole world. Nothing else even looks like a bird. They're real willing to talk about what's the problem with it. And I don't see this monolithic view held by the evolutionists at all. I mean, I just got done going through six books on early man for a paper on the Piltdown hoax, and these guys can't agree on a whole habilis at all. There's no view out there that's saying, yes, it's this way, yes, they did this. They're real flexible on that. I think it's kind of who you talk to, but I sure don't detect this evolutionist monolith out there that okay. has to be, a, you know, that they're all got this view because they don't. One way or the other. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's a good point. But see, what I'm concerned about, I guess, as a high school teacher, is what is in our grade school and junior high and high school textbooks. I assure you, in those books, it is a monolithic worldview. This is the way it happened, boys and girls. It is presented as if it is a fact. There is no other alternatives offered. So at a college level, you may have a good point. But at junior high, high school level, it is, it is a monolithic worldview. This is the way it happened. And so I object to that. I think the teaching of evolution is largely religious, not scientific. Now, we must define our terms. Evolution. I have Webster's Dictionary's definition of evolution. Okay, Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, second college edition, 1986. Evolution, I'm just going to read part of it here, and I'll, you're welcome to look it up for yourself. A development of a species, organism, or organ from its original or primitive state to its present or specialized state, phylogeny or ontogeny. The theory now generally accepted that all species of plants and animals develop from earlier forms of hereditary transmission of slight variations of successive generations. Well, actually, what this, this is, I think, a little deceitful because what is taught in our textbooks is more than just the idea that parents may have children that are different than the parents a little bit. That would be classified, in my view, as microevolution. There is evolution in that sense as far as variations. You know, I have three children. They're all very different. If a couple has ten children, they're all going to be very different. And your grandkids will be even more different. But that's not really evolution. That's where we need to define the term, I guess, and I should have done this earlier. Micro and macro. I would accept microevolution. I would say, for instance, you could get a variety of mutts from the dog pound, and over the next 50 years, through selective breeding, you could develop a wide variety of dogs. You could maybe even develop the Chihuahua and the Great Dane in 100 years. I don't know, maybe take 500 years, but it could be done. But stand 50 feet away and look at it. It is still a dog. It is obviously not a hamster or a turtle or a tomato. It is not really evolution in the sense that's taught in our textbooks. What's taught in the textbooks is that these examples of microevolution are somehow proof of the general theory of macroevolution. And that's where I disagree. This is a religion. There is no evidence whatsoever to back this up. Nobody has ever seen a fish turn into an amphibian, or an amphibian to a reptile, or a reptile to a mammal. Nobody's ever observed that. Nobody's ever found a fossil. That is a belief. The fact that we have micro changes, I'll put that in the fact column. Micro variations. You can ask anybody that raises anything for a living. Find some fellow who raises tomatoes for a living and tries to develop hybrids or purebreds. He will tell you, oh yeah, you can get a wide variety. You may get 50 different kinds of tomatoes. But there are limits. And when the further you get from the norm, you may get one desirable trait but you're going to get some real serious defects. Any cattle breeder will tell you, he can get a cow that'll give a lot more milk, but it's not as disease hardy. You know, it succumbs to diseases easily or some, some other thing else goes wrong. So that would fit perfectly with the creationist worldview that God made them after their kind, not species. Each kind of animal was originally created, and there has been variation and diversification within that kind, but nothing changing to a new kind of animal. For instance, uh, dogs. All the different dogs, including the wolf and the coyote and the hyena and the fox, may have had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue that. But it's still in the dog family. It's still the same kind of animal. You didn't get a new kind of animal out of it. And, the further, and you may diversify to the point where they are no longer interfertile. Great Dane and a Chihuahua. Though technically they are interfertile, except for mechanical reasons. They, are, they, could, produce, <laughs> they could produce a puppy. But, um, they, they are now a, classified maybe as a new species, but it's still the same kind of animal. The word species is really where the problem arose back in the 1800s. Darwin could easily see that you could raise pigeons, and he was a great raiser of pigeons. He could easily see that it doesn't take long to develop all kinds of varieties of pigeons. But you're never going to get a crow. And you certainly aren't going to get a mammal 
or a reptile or a fish out of that pigeon. So all he ever pointed out, and all that has ever been pointed out, is micro changes, which are perfectly compatible with the creationist worldview. There has never been pointed out a macro change. And because of that very thing, there are many now who are going to the punctuated equilibrium theory, like Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge, who are saying, well, we, we don't see any evidence for evolution. Therefore, it must have happened rapidly. So you're arguing from a lack of evidence as proof for your theory? Come on, you better try that one on one more time. That's not going to get past me anyway. Lack of evidence proves it happened? <laughs> no, no, no. That, to me, that's an indication, hey, maybe the Bible's been right all along. Maybe the only evolution has been micro variation, which really would be a proof of an intelligent creator. If I was going to produce some animals to live in a world that had a variety of climates, I would give that animal an incredible <coughs> DNA code so that that animal could produce a variety of babies and some could survive in any given environment within limits. The rabbit can produce long-haired babies and short-haired babies and thick fur and short fur, thin fur. Some can survive the hot climates, some can survive the cold climates. And over the last 4,400 years, they have diversified until today, the Alaska rabbits will not interbreed with the Florida rabbits. They cannot. Their breeding cycle is totally different. Now, the Alaska rabbits can breed with the Minnesota rabbits. They're not too far different yet. And the Minnesota rabbits can breed with Florida rabbits, but the two extremes can no longer interbreed. That's not evolution. That simple variation is still the same kind of animal. That's a micro change. It's still a rabbit, you know. Stand back and look at it. It is obviously not a turtle. So that's my objection, is that the theory of macroevolution is included in with the textbooks for our junior high and high school kids as if it is a fact, and it is a far cry from a fact. It's a religion. You can take, like the branches on a tree. You have the different 250 varieties of dogs probably had a common ancestor, and the ancestor was a dog, right? All the different varieties of cats, you know, Siamese and all those different kinds of cats probably had a common ancestor that was a cat of some kind. From here up, this would be micro changes. This would be observable. Nobody's going to argue with that. From here down, that the dog and the cat had a common ancestor somewhere way back when, that would be macro changes, and that would be part of a faith, a belief, a religion, not observable. No, that's not true. Uh, okay. We don't uh, call macro evolution religion. It is a scientific theory. So it's, not, it's not a religion. It's a scientific theory. Okay. Let me read you a definition of religion. Webster's Second Collegiate Dictionary. Religion, a belief in a divine or superhuman power or powers to be obeyed and worshipped as the creator and ruler of the universe. How did the universe get here? Did this, did this process called evolution bring everything into being that we see today? Is that, was it, is that what created the universe, this process? Well, then that's your God. It is indeed a religion. How did the world get here? Those are your words. Uh, from a scientific standpoint, we would call our interpretation of macroevolution a scientific theory. Okay. And not a religion. I think science and religion ought to be separate, but they are certainly not in our textbooks. To teach kids that the Big Bang is a fact, for instance, and it is taught as a fact in the textbooks. I collect the books. It is taught as a fact. That is wrong. The Big Bang is a far cry from a fact. It's just taught as a theory. Not in the books, it's not. I collect them. It may be in college level, you may be getting it. There's several different options, but you should see what's in the junior high book. Boys and girls, 4.6 billion years ago, Earth cooled down from a hot molten mass. But that's not a fact. I mean, were you there? You know, do you know anybody who was? But I'm t I assure you, it is taught as a fact to our younger kids, and I strongly object to that. Yes, sir? I'm curious about your geological data, okay. for one thing. Um, you talk about the Grand Canyon having originally been a soft sedimentary mass, well, and then forming into, you know, through, I guess, fluvial processes, forming into the canyon that it is today. Mm -hmm. Well, under those circumstances, of course, all of the sediment around it would also be ha have washed at the same level down to the ocean below. Instead of forming rivulets, it would have all formed at the same time. Also, the ocean going from the middle of the continent down towards the ocean basin would cause shell deposits to be found in the middle of like the, the Great Plains right now. And they are. Well, not really. I found 500 shark's teeth in South Dakota in 30 minutes. Oh, okay. That's I got them at home. But why don't we have 100 Grand Canyons all around the world, you know, where these, these soft sedimentary processes were going on? Sure. 
as the, the biblical interpretation would be, during the course of this flood, which lasted just about a year, a little over a year, 12 months, according to the dates given in the Bible, the flood lasted 12 months. The first four or five months were probably with slowly rising waters from a variety of tectonic things, and then the last few months with it going down. But it wasn't just rain 40 days, everybody drowned, get off the boat and go home. It was not that way at all. It was a year-long flood. During that year-long flood, the earth covered by water would develop many thousands of layers of sediments. It is a fact. The earth has layers. Okay? No question. Now, how do you interpret that? The evolutionist interpretation is each of these layers came at either a different season or a different year or a different era or epoch. And they have names for all of them, the geologic column, you know, Cenozoic, Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Archaeozoic, and they got the Jurassic and Triassic and Permian, Cambrian, I'm familiar with all of that. You might be interested to know the only place in the world where you can find all 12 layers in order, the only place it occurs is in the textbook. The geologic column doesn't exist any place in the world in its entirety. If it did, it would be many, many miles thick. It simply isn't, it doesn't exist. It has been put together piece by piece and a little bit of imagination thrown in for glue. Charles Lyell is really the fellow who developed the geologic column. Many others got involved in this, Hutton, Cuvier, Steno, you know, I'm familiar with all that. But Lyell would be the primary culprit in this. The geologic column doesn't exist any place. The fact is, I would, I would say the creationist interpretation is that the flood caused all these layers, or nearly all of those layers, to be deposited very rapidly. Just the earth turning under the moon, causing the tides, with no continents to stop them, the tides would become harmonic. The tides may be 200 feet in a worldwide flood. The rising and lowering of the tide waters would reshuffle all the sediments. You can get a jar of dirt out of the yard here. Well, Florida doesn't have dirt. You've got to go north to get dirt. They've got sand here. But get a jar of dirt, put water in it, and shake it up. It'll settle out into layers for you automatically. It's called hydrologic sorting. Denser particles go to the bottom. Uh, when Mount St. Helens blew its top in 1980, it blew 150 feet of sediment down into the Tudor River Valley. My sister lived right near there. I flew down inside the volcano a few years after it happened with my brother-in-law. Flew all over the area. Can I do, uh, get the slide projector on there? Uh, you can leave your lights on to videotape, but I'll show them a few uh, things that were formed as a result of Grand Canyon. I mean, as a result of Mount St. Helens when it blew its top. Wait, before you get to that, I mean, uh, where, what these sediments arrived, what are they part of if they were laid down a year and then a mountain jet, but where the, where the sediment itself come from? Oh, the, the grinding up, the reshuffling, that's where sediments come from. There's no new dirt being added to the earth, so to speak of. So the being worn? Being reshuffled. Yeah, sediments do that. That's why, like the coal deposits, uh, strip mines, we find coal. That, to me, was because the trees that were destroyed were rolling around and the bark, you know, rolled off. And most coal was made from bark. And the original earth would have had en enormous layers, enormous forests, much bigger than today. Under double atmospheric pressure, plants, trees were huge. Of course, they only lived 1,600 years until the flood took place, so they weren't like the 3,000-year-old sequoias. They didn't have 3,000 years to grow. Do you have an estimate of the uh, depth of water that was added by the flood? I wouldn't, but I know if the oceans weren't as deep and the mountains weren't as high, there's plenty of water now to cover it two miles deep. The Bible says the tallest mountain was covered by 15 cubits, which is about 30, 25, 30 feet. That's how high the tallest mountain was covered. And then as the ocean sank down and the mountains arose, if the mountains rose up slowly, the water would run off slowly, leaving behind nice smooth mountains and big flat plains like Kansas and Nebraska. If the mountains rose up rapidly, like the Rockies, the water would run off faster, carving out features like canyons and you know, Columbia River Valley, uh, carving them out much faster. Why would the mountains rise up now? Well, the Earth is a thin crust. Everybody agrees with that. I mean, why do earthquakes happen now? You know, the plates are moving. The crust is not stable. Plate oh, yeah, yeah, there's plate tectonics. But it hasn't been... You incorporate that in scientific condition? Oh, absolutely. There, I lived right by the San Andreas Fault in California. There is no question. It's moving. All right? <laughs> Ask the folks that live there. You can... You know, after an earthquake and your house falls down. Um, I wish you, let me try focusing this just a little bit here. When Mount St. Helens blew all this mud down into the valley, it made so much sediment, and the sediment automatically stratified. This layer of stratified rock, you can see the layers in that, was formed in one day, 25 feet thick. The next time the volcano blew, a hot, scalding hot mudslide cut across that sediment wiped it out, cut it off, sheer cliff, standing straight up. Five days later, it was hard enough to hold a sheer cliff. I mean, this stuff happens, okay? Mount St. Helens did that. All these fine laminations were formed very rapidly. Here, the, the, the blast was going, hurricane velocity winds, racing across there from the blast of the volcano, and it formed all these layers rapidly. 
Snow does the same thing in a snowstorm. As the snow goes moving horizontally in a bad wind, you cut into the snowbank and look at it. It'll be stratified. The heavier flakes at the bottom in the sand, it'll automatically sort the particles for you. So the creationist interpretation is that all of that so-called geologic column took place rapidly. Right now, today, you can go see Mount St. Helens, and there are several canyons that have been formed there on, from, by Mount St. Helens. The canyons have sheer cliffs, 150 feet high, standing straight up, and they're all stratified, and they were all formed over the last couple of years. The mudslides went through. Some of the old lava flows that were solid, solid rock. That scalding hot mud went through there and carved canyons 100 feet deep through solid rock in 10 minutes. Because boiling hot mud is very abrasive. During the worldwide flood, the water would have been would have had mud in many areas, you know, and muddy water is much more abrasive than regular water. But it would have to be boiling hot to cut through it. I mean, you're talking about cutting through solid rock. You're not cutting through mud, you know. I'm saying it can be done either way. The Grand Canyon is a mile thick in some places, oh, and it's solid rock. I mean, a mud flow is not going to do that in 10 minutes like you are talking about. The top of Grand Canyon is higher than where the river starts. Rivers only flow downhill. The river flows through the bottom of the canyon, one mile up is the top of the canyon. The top of the canyon is higher than the source of the river. So one of two things has to be true. Either the river flowed uphill for millions of years to cut the groove deep enough, or the mountain slowly rose, Kaibab uplift, at the same rate as the river cut down. I think we've got, we're calling on the supernatural here, to so assume that the rate kept pace. I think so. The, uh, the okay. source of water for the uh, Grand Canyon is the Rocky Mountains. So we have a considerable height to work with there. Uh, before you get down to the present day surface, so no matter what the original surface was, you still had that pipe and a snow belt in order to do your initial river. If you would look at the drainage pattern of the Grand Canyon, <coughs> all the area drained by it, the source of the rivers that go through that canyon are lower than the top of Kayabab uplift. How much? I don't know how much lower. You don't know the uh, several hundred feet. The top of the canyon is 5,000, I think 400 feet above the bottom of the canyon. Today, the erosion rate through Grand Canyon is very slow. No question. But today, we just have one little river flowing through there. At the bottom of Mount St. Helens, the canyons that are down there from the trees that were blown over, the log jams were every place. Um, get through some of this here. The rivers that were cut, the uh, features that were cut from the, I guess it's on the previous slide carousel. I'll get the lights back on. Shut that off, would you, bud? Um, the canyons that were cut because of Mount St. Helens exhibit all the features of Grand Canyon. The mud flows stratified everything very rapidly, hundreds of feet thick, and the canyons that were carved out uh, looked just like miniature Grand Canyons, and scientists watched them happen in 15 minutes. You know, so I think that's a mini example of what happened on a macro scale during the year-long flood. Well, they've got a Grand Canyon on Mars that makes the one on Earth look like nothing, so is that assuming that there was a population on Mars that was smitten by a great flood at some point in time? And oh, no, that wouldn't have anything, anything to do with it, I don't think. Uh, uh, canyons form the same way, you know, in each case, so... Well, no, no, I didn't say canyons form the same way in each case. I'm saying Mount St. Helens showed us that's how it could have happened. Okay. I think uh, outer space is full of ice. Nobody questions that. There are ice meteors flying around, super cold snowballs. If an ice meteor collided with Mars, Mars gets hot enough to melt the ice, and it would run and flow and could form canyon features. With human habitation would have nothing to do with the canyon on Mars. Okay? Same with the moon. The craters on the moon, you know, they may be from ice impacts because they find almost no meteorites, but lots of craters. You know, an ice, ice impact would do that very same thing. And outer space is full of comets. Of course, I didn't see it happen, and you know, I can't prove it, but that's... When was your grandfather born? When was my grandfather born? Yeah. Because you weren't there and you didn't see it, so, didn't see it. you know, you're always telling us you didn't see it, you weren't there, but you weren't there for your grandfather's birth either, so how do you know he was born? <laughs> right. That's a good point. That's that a good point. I mean, if we're getting into this, I wasn't there, I didn't see it. Sure. Heck, I'm not looking at what's going on in Chicago right now, but, you know, something's going something's on. Going on sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's where you have to keep that thought in mind. What we teach our students needs to be fair and honest, and we're not doing that. We're only presenting them one view. You read the textbooks, yeah, that author's talking like he was there. 4.6 billion years ago, this happened. 20 billion years ago, the Big Bang took place. Yeah, right. You know, you saw that? 
Yes, so but I object to the dogmatic teaching of evolution in our, in our junior high and high school textbook. Well, is it healthy to do the same kind of dogmatic teaching that schools such as PCC do, using the Bible as their textbook for such classes as chemistry classes or physics classes? You know, I mean, that's just as one side, and these theories are just as tenuous as the kind of evolutionist model that you might come up with. The point would be, like PCC and Christian schools, they teach plenty of evolution. My kids go there. I have their. T I paid for the books. Okay, I believe me. I've read them all. I've caught from the, taught from those same books. The theory of evolution is thoroughly presented. I would say the kids would come out of PCC with a better understanding of evolution than the kids coming out of Pine Forest. Of course, they're not going to believe it, but they're shown how it's. They're shown the theories, and they're shown the fallacies of the theories. They're being educated, not indoctrinated. I would say is the big difference. Take, get all the kids together. Give them a test. Give, give all the kids in America a standard science test. The kids going to a Christian school, which is about one-fourth of the cost, will test higher overall. You'll get a few duds in every group, you know, but the general overall average, the kids will test higher in every subject from private schools. Yes, sir? You can't so much blame that on the office of the, of the books or the scientists going to theories as you can the politics of what the public schools filter into what is taught. I mean, private schools have, have greater funds and have uh, more resources to call from, you know, so you... Wait a minute, private schools have greater funds? Not, well, not greater funds, but okay. uh, more support from... Uh, from the parents? Specialized, right? Specialized groups. I mean, average kid, I think, I don't know what Pensacola's public school cost is. It's probably 5000 a year per kid. If there's 30 kids in a class, that's 150000 per class. That teacher does not make $150,000 a year. Something leaks somewhere along the system. Well, not so much funds as it is support. I mean, it's a specialized group that, that they're paying for, a specialized. Uh, sure. Education. Well, my kids at Pensacola Christian, there are 30 kids in a class, just like the public school, 28, 30 kids in a class. And uh, the teachers don't get paid near as much. I, I pay about 1200 a year, 1500 a year per kid. That's about a fourth the cost of our public school system. To me, um, our Constitution does not give our government the right to get involved in education at all. I think education is the parents' responsibility. Now, if the parents want to get together with 50 other parents and form a local school district, fine. But Uncle Sam ought to have nothing to do with the subject, in my opinion. Uncle Sam has gotten involved in numerous things that has, has no constitutional authority to be involved in. It's supposed to be involved in protection. You know, we should have an army and a navy and an air force. And it should be involved in the punishment of evildoers. We should have a judicial system. But in many, like the welfare system, the government should have nothing to do with that. That's, that's part of our major problem. The more government gets involved in, which is a whole other subject, you know, but the more taxes they take, and pretty soon we get socialized system where Everything goes to them, and they just distribute it out, which is what Karl Marx's system is all about. But back on creation and evolution. The creationist worldview would say the world is not millions of years old. It doesn't need to be. Everything can be explained in just a few thousand years. And there are some scientific facts that point to the world not being millions of years old. I'll get into that in a minute. Yes? What do creationists feel about the rest of the universe? Oh, the rest of the universe? Oh, we think it's out there. <laughs> Did God create the rest of the universe? Oh, absolutely. I believe God created everything, pretty much as is. There have been some stars fall apart. We've seen some novas and supernovas, but nobody's ever seen one form. We've seen meteors fall apart. Nobody's ever seen one form. What we see is what would be predicted by the creation model, decay, the second law of thermodynamics. Things are winding down. It started with an initial amount, an enormous amount of energy and order and design. It was perfectly formed like a car coming off the assembly line. And since then, it's been steady decline. Would he built it with planned obsolescence or what? I don't think it was built with planned obsolescence. I think it was, it was built to be the perfect place for man. And then man was given the freedom of choice. You can choose to serve God and obey him or not. If you choose to disobey, there are consequences. If you choose not to change oil in your car for 40,000 miles, there are going to be some consequences. But how can you blame mankind for, uh, for causing the case? Meteors falling apart, stars falling well, yeah, as far as all of the nature, see, all of this, it's the creationist worldview would be that the whole universe was created by God, and then man was only put on this earth. I can't prove there's anybody anywhere else. I don't think there is. I can't prove there is or isn't, but that's a diff outside of the realm of science. But because of man's sin, the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, is part of the curse on this earth, and everything is winding down, falling apart. Your house gets dirty, not clean automatically. Your car falls apart, doesn't run better automatically. Everything takes work. And nearly everybody in the world is involved in fighting against the second law of thermodynamics. That's why we have carpenters to build new houses, because the old ones are falling apart. That's why we have repairmen. That's why we have mechanics, you know. Just everybody's got a job because of the second law of thermodynamics. 
So if, even if there is a God who has created this perfect system originally, but then gives man or people free will to choose to do otherwise, why would you even choose to be on the side of a God who does sort of, sort of things like that, you know? Who gives you free will and then says, well, if you don't worship me, then you're screwed. Sorry. We're really getting off the subject here. I mean, I'm okay. sorry. We're really getting off the subject. Yeah, that would be a little different. Uh, was there a creator at all? Might be, this might be a bigger view of there had to be a creator of some kind. Now, who is, who was he, and what's he like? What are his attributes? What's his personality like? That's kind of a different subject, but is there a creator? You know, and then if there's a creator, was it Buddha or Allah or Jehovah or, you know, that's, this is where theologians differ by the thousands, you know. And the only way to know for sure who's right is to ask me, of course. Uh, <laughs> I've been involved in, you know, a lot of things as far as energy conservation. I've built numerous houses, and I have tried, you know, with all the different energy conservation laws, but, uh, uh, as well as uh, thermal, I mean, uh, wind generators and that type. Sure. I'm very interested in that type of stuff. Okay, I'd love sure. to love to see the results. Give you an energy award. You did love it. It's a great yeah, nice talk. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> I have a question going back to the dinosaurs. Um, okay. Where, do you think that the dinosaurs that survived past the flood were just survivors that uh, did not go, or were there dinosaurs that were, uh, I mean, small ones, of course, that were on the ark, or were they all just survivors in the water, like plesiosaur or the brontosaurus or so? Uh, okay. Were there dinosaurs on the, on the ark? I would say there had to be dinosaurs on the ark, those that needed to be. The Bible is very plain. Noah brought air-breathing, land-dwelling animals. He did not need to bring fish on the ark or whales. We have classified whale as a mammal. Well, that, our classification system dates back a couple hundred years. The Bible classification system may be different, where if it lives in the water, it's a fish, be it whale, dolphin, you know, or barracuda. So we cannot take today's classification system and, and fault the Bible because a whale may have been considered a fish in biblical terminology, which was long before Carolus Linnaeus came along. But the air-breathing, land-dwelling dinosaurs, we assume Brachiosaurus would have been land-dwelling, though some say, no, they lived in water because they were too heavy to support their weight. I don't know. But Noah, being 600 years old when this boat was built, would have been smart enough to figure out to bring two babies on the ark. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. All right? The reason for bringing babies would be numerous. For one thing, there's only about 40 different kinds of dinosaurs. There are 800 different varieties in the textbooks, you know. There's a Brachiosaur, the Apatosaur, the Cetosaur. Uh, but if you look at a Cetosaurus and an Apatosaurus, you're going to say, that's the same kind of dinosaur. It's like there are 250 varieties of dogs, but Noah only had to have two of the dog kind on the ark. There may be 800 names of dinosaurs out there for these kids to try to learn, but there's only 30 or 40 basic kinds. And if you limit it to babies, no problem, or young ones. After this flood, the climate was different. The water-dwelling dinosaurs, of course, many of those would have been destroyed in ca catastrophic conditions. Fish get killed in the water. You know, an earthquake underwater can kill fish in the water. Thermal shock or uh, uh, just the shock of the uh, tectonic plates moving. But some would survive. You know, because there's a catastrophe, in a worldwide catastrophe, doesn't mean it's simultaneously ca catastrophic. There may be, you know, earthquake here, and six months later, earthquake here. You know, tranquil seas would be someplace. We would have uh, tranquility in the midst of the chaos. Uh, okay. So Noah happened to be in those spots <clears throat> when his, with his ark floating. As part of your theory, did you say that there have been no new species, species created since the creation? I know. No, I would say there have been no new kinds created. As far as species, um, the Great Dane or the Chihuahua is probably a, a phenomena of the last 500 years. They probably did not have any Chihuahuas 500 years ago. But is a Chihuahua a new species? Well, it's kind of a subspecies. All dogs, the same species. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, new species like uh, uh, the frog, for example. Uh, right. There's a whole bunch of varieties of frogs. I don't know how many different varieties, but that's why I would be very cautious to stick with the word kind, not species. Well, by well, species, we define it as uh, interbreeding. Yeah. yeah. So there's, there's, I don't know that I would even go definition. on. There's nothing new since creation. I would not go with that definition. Nothing of, significantly new. Yeah, nothing saying. significantly new. Interfertile may not be the divisional line between the kinds. You might be able to take uh, a horse and a zebra and get them to interbreed. You may be able to get, some have argued that they've been able to get a cat and a dog. I've not seen any proof of that. That kind of stuff appears in Inquire magazine from time to time, you know, that a dad or a cog is born. But um, they argue that you can get a lion and a tiger, a liger. I think that's been done and fairly well documented. But stand away and look at it. They're both the same kind of animal. You know, you, so, so many species have disappeared since then, oh, yeah. but none have been created. So many, none Many species have disappeared, and some complete kinds may have disappeared. Probably the Tyrannosaurus rex. I would say, within the first few thousand years, if you could kill a T-Rex, you would be a hero.
they tell stories about you around the campfire. And the story gets blown out of proportion with the telling of it, and pretty soon he's got, you know, breathing fire and flying around and, you know, big as a mountain. But I think the basis of the story was in historical fact. They were killing off dinosaurs. <laughs> the Bible doesn't mention dinosaurs. Oh, it does too. Uh, does it really in the book of Job, kind of oh yeah, Job is right in the center of the Bible, just before the book of Psalms. Job chapter 40 <coughs> and verse number 15 talks about behemoth. It says, Behemoth is the chief of the ways of God. The Hebrew word there is the biggest. That would, I think, probably be the Brachiosaurus. It says he moves his tail like a cedar tree. Well, had a tail like a cedar tree. Some reference Bibles will say Behemoth it was an elephant hippopotamus. You've got to understand, in 1841, the bones were put together of the first reconstructed dinosaur. 1841. King James Version of the Bible was translated in 1611. So if dinosaurs were nearly extinct a thousand years ago, let's say for all practical purposes they're totally extinct. People forgot about them. During the Dark Ages, the knowledge of dinosaurs and dragons was lost. First-hand knowledge. They're gone. They died out 500 years earlier. When they started putting the bones together in the 1800s, the people said, wow, when, when did this animal, where did this come from? So it was a golden opportunity to try to teach, well, maybe they lived millions of years ago. Actually, it was in the 1800s that the word prehistoric was invented. The word prehistoric will not be in a dictionary from the 1700s. Would you say dinosaurs were around during the time of the Roman Empire? I think they were, and I have some pictures. On, I got six, seven carousels full of slides. Roman mosaics have been found showing dragons fighting, long-necked dinosaurs. Um, C c paintings found in caves in Africa, even scratchings in the walls of the Grand Canyon depict dinosaurs. Legends by the thousands, of course, persist of dinosaurs, or what I would consider dinosaurs. They call them dragons normally, the typical uh, designation of it. Many of the ancient ships' logbooks talk about dragons or, or sea monsters. Captain Peter McKay, HMS Daedalus, here's the whole account right here. He and his whole crew watched for 20 minutes as a sea monster swam under their boat. The sailors begged him. They said, Captain, don't write this in the logbook. We're just going to get laughed at even though they all saw it. I mean, there are thousands of stories like that out there. And there are books up here in your library, you know, about Loch Ness Monster and Lake Champlain Monster. And I, there have been 21 expeditions now to Africa. Right. Largest swamp in the world is the Likawala Swamp in Africa, 55,000 square miles, which makes it bigger than the whole state of Florida. <coughs> that swamp, Dr. Roy Mackle, University of Chicago, microbiology professor, he's been over there twice. He's going again this month or next month. His phone number and address is right here. Call him up. After his two trips in 1980 and 81, a movie was made called Baby about the possibility of dinosaurs still living in the African swamp. Now, I'm not saying they're everywhere and they're running around Pensacola, but there are, it's a big world. You get a swamp as big as Florida that's nearly uninhabited. Matter of fact, the Congo government that owns it said it's 80% unexplored. You know, they've flown over it and mapped it, but that's not exploring it. If it's such a big world that we can miss dinosaurs, then maybe we're missing some new species that you claim aren't happening. I mean, how do we know that we know all the species that are there and we don't know the new ones if we don't know the old ones either? I mean, here you're, here you're arguing from lack of evidence again. Whoa, no, you're arguing from negative me, position. Yes, you're you telling me that there's, um, I know the name of that thing, when Colum and Bebe might be out there and it's reasonable to assume that. But you're also saying that we know for sure that there's no new species. Oh, I didn't say there's no new species. There might, there's probably a lot of stuff yet to be discovered. You said there haven't been any new species since the flood. You told there haven't been any new kinds would be my argument. What is a kind? That's a nebulous term. What is a species for that matter? Nobody's got a good definition of species what is either. a great definition of species? Um, you'll be the first one to know it. Look it up. <laughs> Everybody's got the bat. Look it up in the little uh, anthropology book there. It's got a definition of species. You get 50 different uh, anthropologists or biologists to define the word species. You come <coughs> up 50 different definitions. Gee, the only one I've ever heard is that it's an interbreeding population. That's the only one I've ever heard. That's the only one I've ever heard. Is, uh, is a chihuahua and a great Dane the same species? Sure. Yes. They're listed as the same species. You look at them there. Okay, but I, I would be cautious about, from my standpoint, of using the word species. I'm going to stick with the word kind, which may be something more like uh, family. I think a dog and a coyote. Is a dog and a coyote the same species? No, same no, genus, though. Are they infertile? Sure. Well, why aren't they the same species? Your definition says they're infertile. They don't have to be. It's an interbreeding population. If they start to interbreed, if you have 300 dogs and 300 coyotes and put them on an island for six months, you got it. That's your population, right? So your definition of species is, is flexible then? No, it's not. It's an interbreeding population. That's the definition. Well, the dogs, the dogs in Florida are not interbreeding with the dogs in Hawaii right they now. They can, though. Yeah, but they're not. 
But they can if they if they, they can if they have to. That's the whole point. Well, since dogs and coyotes are a different species, just because they don't happen to be interbreeding at the moment, now you got you got arguing both sides of this coin. Not at all. Yeah, no, the only the only definition I think anybody here has ever heard for species is this an interbreeding population. What it isn't. It's the only one we've ever heard. I've never heard fifty different kinds. I've never heard anybody argue about that. Well, my dog, then, is not the same species as any dog, because he's been neutered and can't interbreed with anything, so. <laughs> well, he's not a population either. You only got one. But I've never heard this argument you're claiming is out there. I've never heard this difference of the well, I think we're off on a real minor rabbit trail. But, uh, no, 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 you're slipping by all these absolutes that, that aren't really absolute. You're telling me there might be dinosaurs out there. You're also telling me that we know, we know, that there have been no new kinds happening. If it's such a damn big world, then how do we know we know all the kinds? I mean, it's pretty silly to say we know what's not out there. <laughs> I can say no scientist has ever observed a new kind of animal. Gee, talk to a microbiologist. They're making new kinds of microorganisms all the time. They're making varieties of old ones. Oh, I They're making some that are resistant to certain bacteria, but it's still, a, I mean, resistant to certain drugs. It's still the same basic kind. Oh, it is? Stand 50 feet back and look at it. It is obviously not a tomato or a hamster. They put human genes into plant cells. You tell me that a mixture of human and plant genetics is not a new kind? Is it fertile? Does it reproduce it's itself? It does. Part human, part plant. You, it, it's carrying. That's how they make. That's how they're making vaccines. That's how they're making antibodies. They use monkey tissue to make uh, the vaccine. The World Health Organization used for smallpox. Oh they yeah. They the virus in monkey tissue because it's got monkey genetics. Hey, that's a human vaccine. It's squirted in a human. You don't get smallpox. Oh yeah. That's really? kind of, that, that, that bacterial phage has never existed before. It's never carried those genes before. It's still a bacteria. No, it's not. What is it? Point. Who knows what it is? It's a half bacteria and half something else. So yeah. you're saying, here's your argument. With human intervention... No, it's not an argument. It's just what it is. I'm not arguing the point. I'm just saying there it is. You here's, know. Your, here's, here's your point. point. With human intervention... Creators. With a, a creator intervened and made it. With, a, with, a, with, an intelligent, with intelligent input, you can mix two things together that formerly would not mix together and create something new. Sure. I would say that's what the creator did initially. He created things out of nothing initially, created some basic kinds, and without any human intervention, without any intelligent intervention, there are no new kinds that have been observed. Never been observed that a new kind of animal. And the animals that do breed tend to stay within the same kind of animal. Dogs produce some kind of dog. Horses produce some kind of horse. And much of the evidence that's presented in some of the, well, okay, I'll call it kind, but much of the evidence presented in our textbooks, for instance, the evolution of the horse from Eohippus to Equus, has been disproven many years ago. Right. But it is still presented to the high school kids. Gee, it wasn't presented to me when I was in high school. I've got the books. I photo, <laughs> I photo <laughs> copy out of the books. I don't know what books you got. You must have gone, I don't know where these people are going to high school, but it wasn't presented to me, and that was a long time ago. Come to my house, one block north Pensacola Christian High School, and I'll show you my huge collection of textbooks, and I can assure you, I can point out many things that have been proven wrong years ago that are still in the textbook. Well, so are we arguing with the theory or arguing with the textbook printers? I mean, they're not the guys that are coming up with the evolutionary theory. They're the guys that are writing high school textbooks. Oh, yeah, the guys that are writing an argument with not evolutionary theory. We're going to argue with the textbook publishing company. I think we need to argue with the textbook publishing company. Yeah, sure. So and the selection to me. As far as the general theory, it is a philosophical worldview. It is not observable. You don't observe any changes from one kind to another. No, absolutely. Okay. Not. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question about your dates. You're changing the, the time length of the flood, and yet all your dates are according to the Bible. So how can we accept the other? Wait, wait, wait. I'm changing the time length of the flood. Yeah, the flood is being 12 months long, whereas in the Bible, it's 40 days and 40 nights. No, the rain was 40 days and 40 nights, but the flood result. I mean, the rain only lasted three days in Iowa, but the flood lasted months. You know, or a month. Actually, see that the flood lasted for 12 months. The dates given in the Bible say 12 months. I mean, you know, 150 days, the flat water was coming up, you know, for, fifth, for 150 days, this was happening. You can read Genesis uh, 7 and add up the numbers given there. Noah was in the ark for 40 days. You know, the rain was 40, I agree. But the flood was a year. That, that's not a conference. I'm not changing anything. That's, those are from the dates given there. Okay? Other questions? Well, we didn't get in. see it, so how can we say that? Uh, historical evidence. Um, the, guy who who caused it, the guy who caused it wrote it down. God oh, caused it to be written down. God did. Have you ever oh, met Abraham Lincoln? Well, yeah, but you have to believe in that. That's oh, yeah. a belief. Do you believe in Abraham Lincoln or George Washington, who you've never seen? No. You know, see, that's where you go from historical that's evidence to empirical evidence. But you've never seen, you know, your great-grandfather, so he probably didn't exist. I have to, no, he existed. I have a historical evidence. I don't have empirical evidence. I have historic, historical evidence. That's where evolution gets into trouble. You choose to believe the reporters. If they're not lying. If they're lying, we're all in trouble, right? That's right. Sure. Maybe we're not in America. Maybe we're in France right now, you know. But... Uh, uh, historical evidence versus uh, empirical testable evidence. And evolution 
has neither. Yes. Uh, other people's historical evidence that contradicts these kinds of things. How about like the Sumerians who say that we were created by a, we, that human beings were created out of these Neanderthal types as a result of trying to create primitive workers and that the flood was a result of a planetary collision in pre pre prehistoric times. That's tremendous historical evidence and it's all over the place. And uh, what about that? Why is okay, it, good point. There evidence? Sure. After this flood, 4,400 years ago, after the flood, the people that survived had children and grandchildren and they diversified into the different cultures that we see today and most folks would agree that the population of the world seems to have started somewhere around the Mesopotamian Valley, Iraq and Iran, which would fit perfectly with the Bible account. Within a few generations, they're telling stories to their kids and their grandkids and the stories get blown out of proportion and today there are 250 different flood accounts. The Sumerians have one, the Babylonians have one, the Chinese have one, the Indians have one and many of them agree in many of the details. Most of the flood accounts will say a family was saved in a boat. Now, you know, how big was the boat and how many were in the family? The details vary, but I think that's typical of mythology as it changes. But to me, the creator that made this whole place would be, would be smart to preserve a record for us and to make sure that we do have the truth. Why on earth would he make the whole thing and then just leave it alone? I think he has taken great pains to preserve the biblical account for us. Lots of folks have died, so we could have that. How, what is your explanation of your historical documents survive? What is my explanation of it? How did it survive? How did the Bible survive? Through the medieval period, since we lost everything else. Well, we didn't lose everything in the medieval periods. You know, there were things preserved. Uh, well, the Carolingian period, is that where it supposedly the Bible survived from the transcriptions of the Bible? Is that the period that you think it survived Well, from? no, I think it survived from shortly after this flood. People knew how to write all through history. There's never been a time when people didn't know how to write. Hist I mean, archaeology says everybody has always known how to write. the original documents? Oh, no, the original documents. I think it would be because smart. Survival of the historical well, the, uh, to me, God knowing, my interpretation of this would be, God knows people tend to worship artifacts and things like this. There's enough slivers of the original cross. Every Catholic priest has one. You can build five cities without you put all them slivers together. You know, obviously somebody doesn't have the original one. No, I'm not sure. I'm a Catholic priest. I don't have one. You don't have one. You didn't get one. They used to give them one, didn't they? No, I never have. There are, there are, supposedly, but that's, that's not a good thing. He's got a little different Bible. So we've got to find out which Bible he's got. Bell is there. Yeah. How can we leave out his under the Bible? What was wrong with that? You know, I don't know. All right. Which is, which is probably another rabbit trail. We may want to not go off on. Believe me, uh, um, you know. Rabbit trails, I'm not too sure about that. I mean, going off on, she's got an excellent point here. If, if, if it's based on a historical survival of documentation, where's the, you know, how do you get this chain of documents? I mean, you're saying everybody has myths. Sumerians have myths, blah, 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 blah. However, if you look at it historically, the Sumerians are writing down their myths before the Christians are writing down anything. They were writing down stuff before there were any Christians. So maybe everybody's well, copying their myths. That, that's, a, that's not a good cultures, way to put all it. All cultures had a flood myth. They, they, yeah. It did happen. But I just want to know where the survival of your historical documents come from for this to be the view, your, your view, and if we're all based on everything on fact, where is this and I Right, and going off into that part of this argument may be beyond the scope of what Dr. Lee wants here as far as anthropology class, okay? I think I could argue the, hist I, I think I could argue the historical preservation of the Bible all, all through time, but that's a, a little different. To stick with the creation evolution argument, was there a creator? Was the world created? Uh, is you know, and whether the, if you want to argue the historical accuracy of the Bible, that's, I think, a different subject than the creation evolution argument. I don't base my uh, belief in creation totally on the Bible. My, my belief that the world is not millions of years old is founded on scientific evidence. Let me give you just a little bit of it, let you analyze that. It is a fact that the world is spinning. I don't know too many folks would disagree with that. It is a fact the world spins about 1,046.6 miles an hour at the equator. Not too many folks disagree with that. It is also a fact that the world is slowing down. Every, this year, 1994, we're going to have leap second. You can call 1-900-410 time and find out when it's going to be. Every year and a half or two years, we will have to have a leap second. I've got the articles in my suitcase of the previous ones. Uh, January 1st, uh, December 31st, New Year's Eve, 1990, was a leap second. Uh, I'm going to put December. 31st of 90 was a leap second. June uh, 30th of 92 was a leap second. Uh, it's Astronomy Magazine. You can look these uh, dates up and that's a fact. The Earth is slowing down. So I'm going to put that in the fact column. The Earth spin 
the Earth's spin is slowing. About a thousandth of a second per day seems to be the reasonable average. Okay, if the world is slowing down, then obviously it used to be going faster. That's fairly reasonable. How much faster could it go before it would totally upset the ecological systems down here? Could the days and nights be nine hours, like Jupiter? Nine hours, 55 minutes total? No, because you said there was a 24-hour day that you believed in, in the creation, so those hours would be the same all the time, and it can't be slowed down. I think the hours would have been maybe 23 and a half hours for a day. That's 4,000 years. If you take out a second every four years. 6,000 years ago, it was 23 hours and 25 minutes. That's right, so there's a whole day gone right there. No, it's only six to 35 minutes. But you're straining at a gnat and swallowing no, no, a camel. No, you said there were you 24 hour camel. days. Hours were the same as they were now. You said that when you started. Okay, okay. I apologize. They were not. They were 23 and a half hour days. Well, Today we don't even have a 24 hour day. That's right. 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 48 seconds. So, okay, they were one day, one's rotation of the Earth. If the world is billions of years old, the slowing spin of the Earth today indicates it can't be billions of years old. There is no possible way you can go back billions of years, adding a thousandth of a second per day. Now, whether it's linear or geometric, I don't know, but it, it does put some kind of time limit. It is a fact the world is slowing down. So for somebody to tell me the world is billions of years old, that's dreaming. That's scientifically impossible. It cannot be true. So, this theory ought to be rejected just on that basis alone. Let me give you a few more. But you don't know what the maximum RPM could be, so how can you say it can't be We know that plants are, are very sensitive to daylight hours. Yeah, the plants may not have been on it all. You're assuming there were plants from the instant it was created, so it's, it's a topological argument. You're assuming that... So the plants evolved this time, they, they were able to... Well, if there weren't any plants in the very first place, and it wouldn't matter how fast, if it was a real hot mass in the first place, which I don't have to believe in, but the right. physics of it is, is pretty obvious. If it was a hot mass of goo at some point and then cooled down, it could be spinning like crazy if it was real hot. It wouldn't be any kind of at all. Mass. I would say, yeah, we lose a mass, sure. I would, say, okay, you're I would say the evidence that it was never a hot mass of goo is extremely strong. Physical evidence. If you want to get into physical science on that, that's what I taught was physics, okay, physical science. But let's cover just a few more. The Earth is slowing down. That's a fact. Here's another one. The moon goes around the Earth. Nobody argues with that. 243,000 miles away at apogee. The moon is receding. We are losing our moon. Astronomers will tell you the moon is getting further away by two to three inches every year. It's leaving us. Well, if the moon is getting further away, then it used to be closer. You bring the moon back in closer, you got a problem because the moon causes the tides. The inverse square law says if you half the distance, you quadruple the attraction. So 30 or 40 million years ago, the tides would have drowned everything on the Earth twice a day. That's just 30 or 40 million, not billions. They can't, you can't tell me dinosaurs were here 70 million years ago when the tides would have destroyed the world 20 million years ago. That's not, that's not common sense. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, are you assuming that the Earth is in you know, stationary? No, the Earth has always been spinning. No, well, but if you're, if you're saying to go back and the moon would be closer to us, then aren't you assuming that the Earth is going to be in the same orbit position as well? Right. I mean, maybe the Earth is in... Well, as far as the distance, no, I'm saying the distance between the Earth and the moon, as we waltz around the sun, you know, they pull each other out of orbit a little bit, but the distance between them is increasing. That's a fact. Right. Now, how do you interpret that fact? Backwards, if what you're telling us now, since the moon is creeping away at the rate of two inches a year, that eventually it'll go away. Right. Well, I'm going to use your same techniques and let it back calculate, and at one point the moon was hitting the Earth. Because you had, you're saying it can't spin, it has to be spinning in order to slow down. Well, in order to be moving away, it has to be at some position in the first place. It could right. never have been in an orbit to move from and have to be on the surface of the Earth. The same thing with our temperature. If you go down in a coal mine, right, it right, gets right. hotter let's, as you go down. Stick, stick with the so let's calculate the temperature back, and if you do that and say, gee, it took... It's, it's X amount of heat losing from the center out and going backwards like you're trying to do with this timeline. It'd be hot on the surface, and the moon would be sitting in the middle of Idaho somewhere like a big lump, and it would move out, move away at two inches a year, away you go. I mean, that's yeah, gradualism right there. there. Well, yeah, sure, but the whole idea of saying that we can't pick these things up in the middle and pick and choose which half we're going to look at. You can't extrapolate a process from the middle and say from an orbit, which we don't know, it's now moving two inches a year, therefore... It's moving away. Well, okay, calculate backwards. That has to be zero at some point. <coughs> but see, the point it would be zero would be 20 to 30 million years ago. Or 50 it's million. 4,000 years old. Which, 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 years which fits ago. fine with the biblical account. If it was all created 6,000 years ago, where the moon was, was created. In orbit or I can calculate surface? back where it was. It was in orbit, but it, wasn't, it was a little closer, not close enough to cause much difference. 6,000 years at two inches a year is insignificant. But when you try to say it's billions of years, it becomes very significant. 
Well, that's, that's my point. That, but that's gradualism. That's assuming with these processes. That's using the evolutionist view and saying that the processes happen gradually ah, all the time. Good point. They, uh, Isn't that what they do on carbon dating? They watch carbon decay for three days in the laboratory and assume it happened for millions of years at that rate? It's the very same assumptions. No, but that's what you're using. You're using the carbon dating curve to tell me about the moon and the age of the Earth. I mean, you can't say the data stinks when they use it for carbon-14, but it's great for the age of the oh, Earth. Oh, I'm in favor of carbon-14 dating. We haven't got into that yet. I'm in favor of that. I understand the assumptions it's based on and the limitations of it. And I think students ought to be taught that. This is why it doesn't work for certain objects. And they, if they a student... We, it's, it's, we look it up in a book. Can I tell you that right away? Sure. Yeah. I taught high school. You ought to see what's in the high school books. It is not that way. Where are you going okay. Oh, man, it wasn't in my high school books. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's stay with this. You said my point. I think you... I think... I don't know if you purposely or, or not purposely missed my point. Not at all. I'm okay. I'm trying to follow you. You keep picking and choosing which is No, the I'm trying to be consistent here. The moon is leaving us. That's a fact. If you interpret that back in time, it does put a time limit. Either the Earth had to be stuck to the moon, yeah. or it was all created already in orbit, and it's moved out a few miles. It certainly doesn't falsify the creationist viewpoint. The fact that the moon is moving would fit fine into the creationist viewpoint. It was created this distance. It's now a little more. Big deal. Could, it, could, it, could the moon not have been moving exponentially, though? I mean, that, that is, I mean, gradualism works, uh, uniformitarianism, I mean, uh, works very well with a lot of things. but. When you, when you talk about uh, the gravity, loss of gravity, if the Earth is slowing down, wouldn't the farther away the moon would get, the faster it would move? So possibly millions of years ago, it was not moving at two to three inches a year. It was maybe moving uh, two to three inches per 100,000 years or 10,000 years. Yeah, that's why I, I mentioned. I don't know if it's a linear line back in, or geometric or you know, logarithmic you progression. Know, you know the equations for gravity, and you know he's absolutely right. That the farther you get away, the weaker the gravity, so it will move farther. As the farther it goes, it'll move faster. It'll move much more slowly when it's closer, and it could sit there for billions of years and move 100 millionth of an inch a year. As soon as it gets out there, wham, gravity starts to fade, out it goes. That's perfectly consistent with the laws. Get your calculator home and figure that out. You'll find out that it puts a time limit of way less than billions of years. It couldn't, not, not, it doesn't fit the evolutionist time scale of 4.6 billion years ago and then life coming here 3 million years uh, ago. The evolutionists don't claim that the moon was put in orbit 4.6 billion years ago. They claim, they, there's people out there that claim the moon was a capture and they don't know the date of the moon. They're not claiming it was all made at once. The evolutionists don't say that for a minute. I don't even believe them, but I know they're not saying that. Okay, I know the capture theory has been disproven mathematically numerous times. That, that's, I don't, that's, well, that's the same mathematics that will show you that it's not moving out at the same rate all the time. And this, this I understand that, sure, the inverse the square law. We're right. going to choose in which chunks of the math we're going to believe here. That's pretty shaky. No, 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 I'm just saying these are some facts. The moon is leaving us. That's that's all I said. My interpretation of the fact, I did not put in the fact column. I said, this is the fact. Today, as we observe it, it's moving. It's leaving. How you want to interpret that is up to you. If you choose to interpret that it started on the surface of the, of the Earth in Utah as a big lump and, and left us, or the Pacific Ocean, you know, the, the, that kind of theory, the, <clears throat> the creationist would say, there is not a problem with the creation viewpoint. If the world's only six or seven or 10,000 years old, and the moon was created, 220,000 miles away, and it's now 240,000 miles away, big deal. It has no effect. It is leaving us. That's a fact. Let me give you a few more. The sun is burning. As the sun burns, it throws off billions of tons every year of matter. It is losing mass. We observe it happening. Now, there's a great argument going of how does the sun burn? Is it by gravitational collapse or is it by nuclear processes? The evolutionists assume it is by nuclear processes because of the severe problem that occurs if it is gravitational collapse. Nobody knows for sure why, what makes the sun burn. We do know as it burns, it's losing weight. Enormous amounts are flying off into space. Nobody questions that. It is losing mass. Sun loses mass. And consequently, it has been observed for 300 years that the sun appears to be losing diameter also. When they first began to measure the sun 300 years ago, Royal Observatory in Greenwich has kept careful records, the sun's diameter on a chart, on a graph of time over diameter, the sun has oscillated as, you know, gas bubbles and things, whatever's going on in there, but the sun has had a general overall trend of shrinkage. The 300-year average indicates the sun is shrinking as much as maybe five feet every hour. This would lend credence to the fact that the sun is burning by gravitational collapse, plus the fact that there have been no neutrinos. If it is indeed a nuclear reaction, there ought to be neutrinos, and all the experiments in the deep wells have indicated no neutrinos. 
Now, there's people, there, that question is still being argued. I am fully aware of that. But the size has been decreasing. The mass has been decreasing. To the creationist, that's no problem. That's expected. To the evolutionist who wants me to think this process has been going on for billions of years, it becomes a serious problem. Be it logarithmic or, or linear, you still have a problem. You have a time limit. This universe cannot be billions of years old. So I see no reason to reject the six to 10,000 year date given in scripture. There's no scientific reason to reject that. And I think there are some great scientific reasons to accept that. I think there are some great scientific reasons to reject evolution as far as the time scale. Time, <clears throat> billions of years, is really only the first obstacle that evolutionists must overcome. If this theory of gen the general theory of evolution would go something like this. Let me simplify it down and show you where my objection is. The general theory of evolution, as it is taught in the books, says 20 billion years ago, and some say 15, some say 25. We're going to pick 20 as a reasonable average, OK? Uh, thank you, sir. The evolutionist is going to say 20 billion years ago, there was a big bang. Now, what exploded and where did it come from is a whole other argument. The creationists will get all in trouble. The evolutionists will say, well, you believe in the beginning God. Where did God come from? But the evolutionist starts off in the beginning dirt or matter, and they don't know where that came from. Really, both are philosophical worldviews, which is my whole point. We are teaching a religion to our kids in school. They say, we can't have religion in the schools. We've already got it. Evolution is a religious worldview, the general theory of evolution. 20 billion years ago, something exploded. Now, where it came from, they don't know. 4.6 billion years ago, Earth cooled down into the glob that it is today. I think there are many scientific problems with both of these, which I could go on for hours if you want. But then somewhere about 3 billion years ago, life arose from this Dirt, rock, matter, non-living material. Life arose from non-living material. By some process, whether it's Miller's experiments or whatever, that's what is taught in our books. Life arose about three, uh, three billion years ago. Really, it is spontaneous generation. No matter how you want to label it or color it or package it, they do believe and teach spontaneous generation. It's the dust of the earth. It says that right Sure. But the dust of the earth from the creation involves an intelligent creator. God can take the dust and put life in it. The dust itself cannot put life in itself. That's the big, big difference. Then, as things went along for three billion years, this life somehow began to reproduce. Reproduce itself. Going from dirt to life is a gigantic jump. Going from life to reproducing life is another gigantic jump. Okay, But this is what is taught in our books. This reproducing life, then, as time goes along, produces variations. These variations, eventually, over the next so many x number million or billion years, produce all the different kinds of life we have today, the basic kinds. Is that the general theory of evolution? I say, this begs the question, what exploded and where did it come from? In order to have a Big Bang, you must start with two things. You must start with some matter and some energy. Enormous amounts, actually, of both. Actually, a little tiny bit of energy, not much, not a matter, actually. Hardly, not enormous amounts of matter at all. But you got to have some matter. What exploded? They, I know the textbook says 4.6 or 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. Prentice Hall, General Science, 1992, page 87. That's what they teach. I've got the books, okay? Yes, sir. Uh, and the, on the uh, give and take that's watched in here on, on the creation of the universe, they, everybody, they build up to the point of the very second where the universe is created, and they say they, they can tell what's happened up to a hundredth of a second before or after it happened, but they can't tell right. exactly what it was. They don't know. Uh, the very instant that of what was there, what was happening, they just, they just don't know. They don't know where it came from or what it was. Which puts it into the realm of philosoph philosophical right. ideas or religion. It's, it's a belief. 
It's interpretation of, of people. Go back to the Webster's Dictionary definition of religion, a belief in a power that created this universe. Evolution is a religion. This, this part of it is. Oh, creationist is too. All right, all right. Oh, absolutely. Right. So what's with so why can't we have a little freedom of religion here? I mean, what's the problem? Yeah. Why, don't we, why don't we get? Well, I I just just why not teach both? Why not teach both? That's my whole yeah. point. Okay. okay. It's certainly not taught in our schools. Maybe at college level. But I go visit any of the high speaking public schools all the time. I've done 60 this year. Okay. I'm in them. I got the textbooks. I look at it. They don't teach anything about creation except maybe to ridicule it. The, the ones that do, well, the way you present it is it's, it's very, uh, the facts make a lot of sense and it's, it's very uh, understandable, but the way that a lot of, I know I've been to many different schools moving around, but the way that creationism is taught, even in the few schools that it is, is not like this. They don't teach it as, as cohesive and as, as uh, they just teach it strictly Bible, this is happening, you must accept it. They're, you know, they don't give you facts to support it, they don't give you any reasons for it. And you're not allowed to question it either at all. Yeah, and they, oh, the that, a I lot of places, know. I know this place I've been, I'm not saying every sure. place is like this, but if it was co as uh, cohesively and understandable put together as this, it, it might be more widespread. Well, I think it is extremely widespread. In the last Gallup poll, 53% of the American population said they believe the world is less than 10,000 years old. That's true. You know, Believe me, it doesn't make itself. Believe in flying saucers, too, and that doesn't that's, make uh, aliens running around either. Let's so. apply that same statement to evolution also. Believing doesn't make itself. Sure. Right. Just make sure that point is in on the tape here. Okay, believing does not make itself. You can believe all you want, but it doesn't make itself. Yes, ma'am. Believing that doesn't make itself either. Sure. So I've never seen God. If I think Oral Roberts had really seen a 600-foot Jesus, he'd still be running. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not one of those on that part of the lunatic fringe of Christianity either, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you don't have a problem with tectonic activity, right? Absolutely. No, t no problem. Well, how can you ignore the enormity of time concerning tectonic activity that it would take to build a wrinkle in the Earth's crust the size of the Andes? Yeah, building on the same uniformitarianism. Okay. The, the Andes Mountains. Let's put that in the fact column, okay? Andes Mountains exist, right? But, but not due to tectonic activity? Is that your point? The fact that they exist, and they are moving, and earthquakes happen, and Alaska had an earthquake where the ground went up 40 feet in 10 seconds. Right. Tore houses right in half. Are you going to take that same uniformitarian assumption? If the ground can go up 40 feet in 10 seconds, you, we should have mountains up to the moon. Obviously, there are catastrophes that alter the uniformitarian theory. I think this flood was that catastrophe. I think the mountains arose in a matter of a few months. I agree with tectonic activity. But the fact that the mountains can rise, the fact that we see earthquakes in Los Angeles where the ground shifts seven feet, does not prove it has been going on for millions of years. It might have all started 50 years ago or 500 years ago. We don't, you can't prove that part of it. You see my point? Yes, there is tectonic activity. I lived right by the Hayward Fault and the San Andreas Fault. I've been to Real Foot Lake. I've studied all the major faults in America. Been there, looked at them. Top and bottom, Grand Canyon, Royal Gorge, been there. But that doesn't prove it's been going on for millions of years. It might have all taken place just 40, 400 years ago with the flood. You're, you're, you're comparing something that, that rose 40 feet high to the Andes, okay? I'm talking about a mountain range that I feel based on tectonic activity sure. was a gradual and continuous. And I'm not saying that uniformitarianism is something that I believe religiously. I just can't understand how, if you've got a 6,000 year time span mm -hmm. you, and you believe in uh, uh, tectonic activity oh, yeah. exists, sure. that you can't, uh, how do you explain the mountain range? I think 90% of the mountains, of the mountain height, was formed very rapidly. We saw that with Mount St. Helens. It lost 3,000 feet in 10, 15 minutes. Poof, gone, blown down into the valley. Circe off the coast of Iceland. All of a sudden there's a volcano. Mount uh, Paracutan down in Mexico. Sure, but that's at a divergent point line. Absolutely. There are cracks in the earth. The Bible says, in, at the time of the flood, the fountains of the deep broke forth. I think the earth cracked and the water came out from in the crust and hot water hit normal water and killed fish by the zillions in that area. And there was, that's why we have the Lompoc, California, uh, 1,500 feet thick um, fish beds. Fish beds. Yeah. Yeah. To me, the, you think that 1,500 feet fish beds in Lompoc, California was uniformitarian? I'm, not arguing I'm saying that doesn't fit the facts. Right, they were killed real yeah. quick, too. They're they were killed quick. Down, yeah. Yeah, so to me, the biblical account of the flood is a good explanation of that. Certainly not falsified by the fact that they exist. And they're found in all sorts of positions. There was a whale found in 1976 in Lompoc, California. 80 feet long, standing on its tail. 
thousands and thousands of layers of sediment all the way around it. And yet for years, the, the uniformitarianists have been saying each layer is a different season. Well, if you've got an 80-foot whale and the layers are 50 layers to the inch, that whale did not stand there for millions of years on his tail. <laughs> Obviously, those layers were deposited very rapidly. If you want documentation on that, um, I got it here on the table someplace. So, I'm on the Lompoc, California, and what happened? I've got some of the fish fossils. You know, some are flat in the layers. Some are standing up, running through the layers. Those layers did not get deposited in uniformitarian process. Well, that, that movement in uh, such a, like in Alaska, that 40 feet, that, that's directly proportional to the inactivity that hasn't happened for a long time. It takes that pressure a long time to build up. That, that punctuation of movement took uh, you know, a long time right. to build the strain. So that, that one uh, severe movement uh, may have taken thousands of years to build up enough pressure to, to force that up. So you know, the mountains movement may have taken uh, a million years oh, to sure. build up enough pressure to, to, to move that much, you know, 30,000 feet or But by, by the same token, you haven't proven that it didn't start just 40, 400 years ago with the flood. Sure. Well, there's still ruins at the 1,200 foot altitude level in the Andes also that indicate like ship piers and tie-ups and things. They're 1,200 feet from the existing ocean level. So you've got a lot of stuff like this. What I find is that you're very, I have to applaud you a lot because all the anomalies that, uh, I'm not a creationist, but I, I'm always arguing with people about how the evolution view doesn't work and genetics is really kind of goofy and there's tons of, I mean, they find human fossils in coal mines for crying out loud. There's loads of anomalies all over the place and the, the straight right hand of the chart evolutionists, you know, big science can't handle it. Same with the energy stuff we're telling you about. They can't handle any of that stuff at all because it doesn't fit into it. But it doesn't lead me to a, a biblical interpretation. I just think it's just the Bible maybe one more you know, straw in the, in the mix, and maybe one more example of people accounting for these okay. anomalies and trying to grasp with them somehow. Would the human fossils found in coal mines, as you mentioned, uh, would that be, could that be explained by a worldwide flood? Sure. Oh, there's a worldwide layer of mud. I mean, the, the worldwide, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it, flood catastrophe is, hardly anybody will really argue with that when you push them to it. I mean, you dig around just about anywhere, you hit a big layer of mud, and you go down, bang, there it is. You know, all kinds of people. I would, I would extend that even further and say nearly all of the layers were deposited during that one year long flood. Okay. Edmund Hillary, 1953, climbed Mount Everest, first man that we know of to reach the top Mount Everest. And he got to the 26,000 foot level. He had 3,000 feet to go. At 26,000 feet, he began finding seashells. <laughs> the entire top of Mount Everest is covered with seashells and clams. 3,000 feet thick on the tallest mountain in the world that we know of, K2, maybe a few feet higher or lower. People argue about that, you know, but. It's one of the tallest for sure, probably the tallest. Why are there petrified seashells on the top of Mount Everest? Well, the creationist view would say, no problem. The Mount, Mount Everest wasn't there until after the flood. The Himalaya range rose uh, some, you know, as the fountains of the deep were broken up. I'm talking global catastrophe. Really, the argument is between catastrophism and uniformitarianism. Unusual thing about these seashells, and you can welcome to come take a look at it. I have boxes and boxes of them. Clams like this, let me pass that around, are petrified and they're closed. When a clam dies, it opens up. Go to the beach, you're lucky to find a matched pair, let alone a closed petrified clam. A guy in Alabama up here said, Mr. Hovind, do you want some more petrified clams? I said, well, why? He said, they're four feet thick in my backyard. <laughs> he digs for post holes to put in a fence and finds petrified clams, four feet thick. You can find it, that's got to be about the most common fossil in the world, cephalopods, closed clams, okay? That's a fact. Now, the creationist would say, during this flood, the fountains of the deep broke up, there was thermal shock, animals were buried in mudslides, and the clams are already at the bottom, so huge clam beds are covered, and the only way you can get a fossil like that is to have him be buried alive. And you can find enough of them to build a 10-lane highway from New York to San Francisco. The creationist interpretation fits that just fine. The very existence of fossils at all Fossils don't form unless they're buried. This is a Brachiosaurus toe bone. The very existence of fossils, to me, is another scientific indication there was a disaster. How many buffalo were killed out west 100 years ago? Probably millions. How many fossilized? Almost none. Because they weren't buried. The, the evolutionist interpretation uh, is that these fossils we find are all from different periods, all along for millions of years. Animals die and leave their fossils behind. Animals don't leave their fossils behind when they die today, folks. They have to be buried in mud. That's the way they fossilize.
I think I mean, to, to support your view, or I guess what is also my view, which isn't necessarily a Bible view, but is this kind of un, some, something very unusual occurred, is that there's a, an interesting fossil that they've got at Buffalo that is a, uh, a trilobite that is preserved in stone mud, and its tracks are also preserved, and it's wandering in a little spiral pattern, and the tracks are spiraling, and it goes about four feet and it dies. And their explanation is that it wandered into a toxic puddle, which, of course, sat there oh, totally undisturbed for a million years till it turned into stone. But this, to me, it obviously happened really quickly. I mean, sand, the sl raindrops would interrupt a sand pattern. I mean, it doesn't right. like go to the beach and draw in the sand and see how long that lasts. I mean, there's layers of stone that are essentially beach waves that are hardened in that are solid. Mm -hmm. super Red Rock happened very there. quick. Denver, I've been there. Yeah, Red Rock, we've been there a bunch of times. It's, it's, that stuff happened real fast. And the dinosaur footprints at Red Rock are at a 45 degree angle. Okay, let's Did give the creation. The slide off exactly sure. sure, the creationist interpretation is it was flat land. The dinosaurs are fleeing the flood. They left their tracks behind. It took several months for that flood to kill everything. You get rising and lowering waters, and they leave their tracks. They get hardened. Somebody else leaves tracks. They get another layer. Eventually, the mountains lift it up, and today the tracks are at a 45 degree angle. There's no problem with that evidence as far as the creationist viewpoint. That fits fine. Now, both are theories. The anthropology, which is what this class is, and we probably ought to stick a little more to that. Uh, anthropology, uh, we're off on all these philosophical rabbit trails, but um, anthropology, the, per the, 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 the philosophy of this author and this whole course is man is progressing. We used to be more primitive. We used to be some kind of ape-like animal, or we have a common ancestor with the apes, and we went through these various stages of Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Homo sapien, etc. And I say all of that is baloney. I think after this flood, there's been a variety of people produced. Some maybe had uh, Eskimos, for instance, live in environments where they get plenty of fish oil, almost never have heart attacks, but they're deficient in other vit vitamins. Different people in different climates tend to get certain deficiencies. Unusual traits would become pronounced. Indians have high cheekbones. Orientals have different color skin. Blacks have a different color skin. All have a common ancestor, I would say. It's Adam. Or even after the flood, Noah's sons. I don't know who Noah's sons were married to as far as daughters. There may have been some diversity before the flood. And one of those daughters may have been considerably different, which would have preserved unusual genes through the flood. But there's no problem from the creationist viewpoint. It has never been falsified. The creationist, young earth creationism, was rejected by many in the 1800s, not because it was falsified, but because it didn't fit their lifestyle. Thomas Huxley said, we like evolution because it gives us sexual freedom. There's no longer a creator that says, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's why Thomas Huxley liked evolution. I don't know if that's why everybody likes it, but that's why he liked it. Um, you mentioned Noah's sons, or Noah's daughter, and son of Jeff. And do you think it would be possible that the populations in the world today could have been created by three people, by three couples? Could the populations today be created by three couples? Absolutely. That's what I showed you earlier, the population growth statistics. At the time of Jesus Christ, there's only a fourth of a billion. Normal populations grow 2% a year. If you figure 2.6 kids per family, and you'd knock out 30% of the population every 100 years for floods and famines or catastrophes, wars, you can do, generate from, from six people. You can generate a population of six billion in 4,000 years. Then nobody would argue with that that knows their mathematics. Now, that doesn't prove it happened, but it proves it could have happened. It doesn't falsify the biblical account, is my whole point. Another whole subject we may want to discuss, and this last time I was here raised a, uh, no, that's not it, raised a lot of eyebrows. Uh, what are the... Being out there, some divine something to okay. answer the questions we can't answer, but what's the, uh, there's no problem with, uh, that there shouldn't be a problem for us to try to find our own answers either. Yeah, that's God's finger snap. Big bang. Right. That's, that's a way of looking at it. You believe God started with the matter, God supplied the energy, and God supplied the matter, and God started. That, that, uh, I, well, I'm not just, okay. I, I don't really have a theory about that, but I, okay. I think that's a reasonable thing. Yeah. This then is teaching that God uses millions of years of suffering, misfits, death. He has no idea what he really wants. There's billions of blind alleys, dead ends, species evolve, can't compete, they die out. Tooth and claw, struggle for life. You can do whatever you want. But, but, he made the flood. Like, he made the flood. There's something now. What the heck? Yeah. This is a, an unintelligent God who doesn't. He, 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 he doesn't. Oh, no. yeah, but how, if he was so intelligent, how did he have to wipe us out in the first place? That doesn't make oh, any sense. He, he gave freedom of choice. Let's take the question too. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say that. Um, at that point in time, when you say that 
Are you not imposing your three-dimensional worldview on God that exists in more dimensions? When you, when, you say, when, you say, when you say that God doesn't know what he wants, it's a blind God that, that makes people suffer and makes people die, aren't you imposing your limited perception of what God is on, on the reality of God? No, I'm saying, to me, the evolutionist worldview is if they say God did this, then God is cruel. Well, you're telling us that unless we believe we're all going to burn, that seems pretty cruel to me. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't say that. Yeah. I didn't say that. I just said that, 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 that we have a choice, and we made the wrong choice, and that's why the flood hit. Well, that's not what choice you've made at all. I've never asked you if you're no, going to no, no, no. Yes, Matilda. Do you not feel that what's going on now in the world is not cruel, and that God's not alone? Oh, there's a lot of cruelty going on now. I mean, if you're saying that it, if that being so, that there would be a long period of time of cruelty, you're explaining this time of cruelty. I think after the flood, early in the creation, it wouldn't do any good for God to make robots. He could, excuse me, he could have programmed Adam and Eve like a computer. I, I'm 6'1", my wife is 5'0". I can go home, grab her by the throat and say, now you tell me you love me. Well, I could easily beat her up, you know, 100 pounds, 5'0". But that, that's, not, that's not what I want. I want her to want to love me. So God gave his creatures, his creation, a freedom of choice. God said, Adam, here's the rules. Do this, do this, beautiful world. I've got everything for you. I just don't want you to stay away from that one tree. If there was no choice, if there was nothing to choose between, then it's not really a choice. Then when man sinned, God right away started a program to buy back his creation, if they'd take it. But see, God being perfect and just, the God that I worship, per absolutely perfect. He cannot tolerate sin. Everything must be fixed. We get all upset with our justice system because the criminals go free. There's something in man that wants justice done. Somebody murders somebody in your family, you want to see some justice done. That's just part of human nature. We want justice. I think that's part of our shady image of God that we still have. We, want, we like things to be fair and just. God created it. They sinned. God says, I'll pay for it if you'll let me. I'll die on the cross. My blood will shed. I will pay for your sins if you'll accept me. Some don't want to. Some do. So man has been the cause of progressive decline in this country. There have been more and more problems in this world. More and more violence, more and more anger, because people have rejected God, the God of the Bible. I think the, the cruelty that's going on here is man to man and caused by man. The evolutionist says there was billions of years of cruelty before man ever got here. You're calling it billions of years of cruelty. Why are you calling it billions of years of cruelty? Were the, uh, when, when the simple life forms evolved, did they have to compete? Did they have to kill each other to get ahead? Was there struggle for life? Was there, there uh, death? There is now. There is now. Oh, there is now, right. Has this been going on for years before man got here? Yes. That's the evolutionist worldview. That man came on the scene somewhere, some kind of primitive man, whoever it may be, along in here someplace. Right. The creationist says man was made perfect to begin with, and we've seen a steady decline. God is going to intervene. He's going to fix it. You mentioned the creationist tigers were not meat eaters. Absolutely. The Bible teaches before the flood, everything was vegetarian. It was not until after the, after the curse when man sinned, or it really it was in Genesis chapter 9. Genesis 9, 3, the Bible says, God told Noah, now you can eat meat. Man was initially told in Genesis 1, 29 and 30 to eat plants, vegetables, and seeds. Vegetarian diet. Under the pre-flood world with an increased air pressure, people today live fine on, you know, vegetarians do just fine today. But man was, everything was designed to be vegetarian, including all the animals. And it was maybe because of the climate changes or maybe because of atmospheric conditions that they became carnivorous. As far as venom for the snakes, the University of Oklahoma has done intensive research on snake venom. The Oklahoma has plenty of rattlesnakes. They have found that if you, to get, if you get a snake bite and you shock it with a, a stun gun or with a uh, spark plug, take a spark plug wire off, turn the motor over, zap, and spark. If you shock the spot where the snake bit you, it will straighten out the protein molecule. When a snake bites you and injects the venom, be it hemotoxic or neurotoxic, the snake venom is a complex protein molecule that's all tangled up and your body can't do anything with it. But the electric spark straightens out the molecule and it becomes a vitamin. It's nutritious. <laughs> well, this is, getting, this is getting very bizarre here. You better read, you better go see what University of Oklahoma. Now listen carefully. No, no, it's true, but I mean to think that snakes are around biting for your own benefit is pretty I think snakes, <laughs> now just listen, snakes, 
Snakes have very sensitive heat pit organs. They can sense one one thousandth of a degree. So when you're sick, a rattlesnake comes along and says, gee, you're on a... This guy needs vaccinated. I'm going to bite him. <laughs> what it, how did we get poisonous snakes? What's, what's the evolutionist interpretation? This came about by blind chance. Do you know the complex mechanism of a poisonous snake? Sure. There's a zillion things have to evolve simultaneously. It uses its venom to eat its prey. It can control the amount of venom that's in a mouse. It can stun it. And that all just happened by chance? I'm not, I'm not talking about That's that. what you believe, though. It's not a do you agree with me, Jason? Sure. Yeah, but you're saying this, the, these, the these very no, com... I'm not. I'm, I'm sorry, okay. saying that at all. But the evolutionist says these very complex systems that we have for instance, the human eye, a billion things have to be right to make it work, and only one thing has to be wrong to make it not work. And that came about by chance not over chance billions of years. Processes. The process of, of right. trial and error, basically. Here we are back to this process. Now, this is the mysterious process that I keep referring to. This is God. You can't process. Yeah, yeah. Evolution is a process, you and evolution is given mean. all of the attributes of God. This mysterious process is able to create complex things from simple things, this mysterious process called evolution with a capital E is capable of starting from nothing and going to everything. This, I don't care if you want to admit it or not, you check me out. This is your God, a process. Uh, there, it's, it's the Somebody else had a question? No, okay. This is a label for something we don't understand. You call it God, you call it Bob, you call it, you know, anything. I mean, it's just it's kind of silly to get to the analysis sure. and say, the air, but we don't understand it, ergo it's God. I mean, that's pretty wacky. <laughs> but you are attributing uh, a personality. No, you are. You're saying that it's God. He's just. You, no, he's got you, rules. He's got commandments. He doesn't like us. No, I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying. It's a process. I'm saying he has many rules at all. He doesn't care. It's just. It's a like process. This this process of evolution is one that has the personality. Evolution. Evolution. You read the books. Evolution experimented with this for millions of years until it finally came up with a design that works. Isn't that kind of those kind of sentences are in here, right? The difference. The difference being the, the attribution of evolution is multiple beings. Uh, or animals on Earth that have changed and caused a group difference. And difference in God is it is one being putting its processes down on multiple beings, not creating, you know, not because of, of evolving, you know, occurrence, something happens with what happens, you know, maybe this animal has to evolve because of that or, or some other catastrophe, and not because something else wanted it to change. Because if these beings, uh, the creatures that lived on the Earth needed that change or... or How did they know they needed it? They didn't know, it just ke chemically, so uh, biologically, it had to happen for them to... You're back to your magic process. But it doesn't have a personality. It doesn't say, this must happen because I want it to. It, ha it happens because if this is to survive, so gravity. it must just fall down because the floor loves them and it wants to grasp them more tightly. They just fall down because they fall down. Okay, gr nobody understands what gravity is. I mean, I taught physics. We know, you know, the velocity of different objects based on what planet they're on and all that stuff. But there isn't anybody who knows what gravity is. How does the Earth know where this chalk is right now? It's at least understood. It doesn't. That's the whole point. It doesn't have the attributes of personality. It isn't. Cruelty doesn't enter into this process at all because we define cruelty. You shoot your dog when it's hit with a car, you're thinking you're putting it out of its misery. You're still killing it. Is it cruel or not? That's a value that we put on there. Okay, now let's take, that, let's take that same analogy for those who say God is cruel by killing uh, the infants in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's That's the same? Now, just, let's follow this through now. Suppose that God knows that that city is full of diseases, including the children, because of their just horrible practices with uh, all sorts of things that they were doing, incest and uh, homosexuality and things that filled that society with diseases. God's people are going to move into this area. God says, I want you to kill the whole population for their own good and for your good, so this disease is wiped out off the earth. The then the guy's a smart guy. He's a smart God. To, to, to command the execution. It's like me pulling weeds out of my flower garden. Well, all right. Wait, wait, wait. Let's not say God created the diseases. Some of the diseases are perfectly fine and helpful to different organisms, like sheep. Sheep get venereal disease. It's no big deal. It's like a cold. But when sailors have sex with sheep on board ships, and sailors get venereal disease, and that's how venereal disease got started. Wow. Study your history. Is that God's fault? I wasn't there. I can't tell. <laughs> See, no, the, the smart, the smart, all-wise, all-powerful creator not only created everything, he gave him a book, the Bible, says, don't do this. If you do, things are going to go bad. They did, and things went bad. Well, things went bad. Wait a minute, one at a time. Go ahead. Do you, do you think that, I mean, do you think that the man throughout time is totally truthful and totally honest to the point where they could interpret the Bible over thousands of years uh, verbatim, the way it was first written? I mean... 
there, there is proof, I, I don't have any documentation with me, so I can't really substantiate this, but there's proof that when King James interpreted uh, the Bible, he left out a lot of things, a lot of women, a lot of, a lot of occurrences that he didn't believe should be in there. And do you believe that it sh should be taken so literally when it's been interpreted by so many different people and rewritten and maybe those monks that copied it down changed it just a little bit or, or whoever wrote it down changed it to their liking. Do you think it should be taken so literally? I think it so okay, we're, we're opening up a, a whole new subject of is the King James Version of the Bible, for instance, the infallible, inspired, well, preserved that, Word I mean, of God. Uh, I think, I think uh, that would be a, a fascinating discussion, which I'd be glad to get into. But I, that would draw us way off of our main subject of creation evolution. Yes, I think God is not only capable of making this world, he's capable of preserving his word for us so that we have it today. And I, don't, I disagree that it's been translated thousands of times. I think the, origin, the priests that were in charge of keeping the, the texts were very, very cautious. They would make a copy, and then they would have five other people count the words. They'd count it backwards and forward. It had to be an exact copy. It was destroyed. And so eventually, the original manuscript was worn out from use, and they would certify some of these copies as exact copies. They counted the letters. They counted the words. These guys, that was, that was a very serious job. They would take a bath and wash out the pen and start fresh before they wrote the word God or Jehovah. They took it that serious. I mean, it was maybe overboard. but that's, it, So the original text may be gone, but that, that is really probably to our benefit because now we have so many thousands of copies that are just precise like the original, and they were carefully certified. And then there's not an original piece of paper for somebody to worship and sell for $50 million a page. You know, oh, here, kiss this page and you'll go to heaven. I think it's good. The original piece of paper is gone, worn out. Some of the older manuscripts are still around because they were not good as copies, so the people did not use them. There were those in, uh, shortly after the time of Christ that tried to pervert the manuscripts, tried to make little changes to get their doctrine in there. Well, the church said, forget it. That's useless. I'm not going to use that transcript. And therefore, that one survived because it never got used. There are five or 6,000 copies of the Greek New Testament that are from the uh, Texas Receptus. Yet you go to the Alexandrian manuscripts, there's only a few hundred of those, but they're older than the Texas Receptus. But the reason they're older and the reason they still survived is because the early church fathers knew this is not correct. This has been corrupted. If there is a God and there is a devil, it would be smart for the devil to try to do that very thing, to corrupt God's word, to confuse humanity, to start 50,000 religions and get people confused and distracted. Any war, any war does that. The enemy comes in, they turn the road signs, they blow up bridges, they try to confuse the enemy. I think there's a real God and there's a real devil, and Satan is using tactics of confusion to try to keep people away from the truth. The truth is very simple. The Creator loves you. He wants to save you. He wants to forgive you. And if you'll ask Him, He will. And so I asked Him 25 years ago. And I have evidence that it happened because there has been a great change in my life that could not have happened just by turn, deciding to turn over a new leaf. I can, go, I can go drink all the alcohol I want. I'm 41. And I do. I drink all I want. I don't want any. And I've never had a drop in my life. Never going to. To me, I, I really want to please my Creator. As I understand His Word, I read the Bible actively and avidly. I memorize large portions of it. I want to do what that book says. I've seen the results in my life. I've seen the results in millions of other people's lives. It's not that I'm better than anybody. I'm a wicked, vile sinner. I deserve God's judgment. But Jesus Christ took it for me. I am going to heaven, but it's not because I'm good or better than anybody else. It's because I'm forgiven. And I would like everybody to be forgiven. You think uh, Jews will go to heaven? I think if a Jew has not accepted Jesus Christ, no, they will not go to heaven. It's only, only Christians then who have accepted I don't, I don't know that I want to use the term, the definition, the label Christian. Only those that have accepted Jesus Christ. There may be people in some heathen pagan society that have asked for God's forgiveness and have no concept of what a Christian is. Sure. The Bible says if you seek after God, God will see to him that you find him. There are those who don't want God because they're afraid of some of the rules that go along with an authority. And that's why in the 1800s, this view caught on. Because there was great prosperity. Industrial revolution brought us all kinds of new machines. I mean, people had time on their hands. You don't have to work six days to build a shirt. You can do it in 10 minutes now on your loom, you know. Along with prosperity came all kinds of vices and sins. And the 1800s was a time of not only great racism. You know, America still had slavery. Charles Darwin's book came out in 1859. During the 1800s, many of the European nations felt they were superior. And they were colonizing these third world countries. Belgium took over countries, you know, and uh, England took over. You know, the sun never sets on the English Empire. The evolution as a worldview, as a philosophy of life, caught on in the 1800s, not because there was evidence against creation, but because it was a way to justify 
the cruelty, the suffering. Uh, Carnegie and uh, R uh, Rockefeller used the theory of evolution to justify their business practices. Standard Oil became a monopoly. Wipe out the competition any way you have to. If there's 10 gas stations, buy nine and starve the ninth, tenth guy out. And then you got a monopoly. We had to have laws. The unions developed in this, this time period, late 1800s. The trust busters, the monopolies had to be broken up. The philosophy of evolution was driving some of these people. The strongest survive, tooth and claw, struggle for life. Well, let's be the strongest. Read, read the biographies of these fellows. Capitalism. Oh, capitalism. The Bible teaches a form of capitalism, but not like we have today. The, I believe everybody should be able to own their own property and reap the results of their labor. If you don't work, you shouldn't eat. That's, that's God's welfare program. Now, if I make money and I would like to give my money to somebody else, that's my prerogative. But should the government take my money from my labor and give it to somebody who won't labor? That's what the church did. That's what the early church did. Yeah, the whole welfare program ought to be the church operating it, or the Christians, or the individuals. This idea, though we're getting into a whole other subject, but the idea of the philosophy of evolution is um, a motivating factor for the 1800s. You're not going to understand the, the historical events of the late 1800s and early 1900s unless you understand the, the philosophy of these people. When a headhunter is taught as a little boy, now Johnny, if you kill your enemy, cut his head off and eat his brains because then you get his power. There are tribes like that, right? He's going to behave that way because of what he believes. That's, everybody behaves based on their belief pattern. If you believe, you're going to face God someday. If you believe the Bible is true, and you believe it's wrong to commit adultery, it's wrong to have premarital sex, if you believe the Bible teaches that and it is wrong, then you're more likely to behave that way. So what you believe determines how you behave. And many of the social questions that we argue about today are really back to this argument, creation and evolution. Let's take abortion, for example. Would abortion be right or wrong? Well, before you answer that, if you believe evolution is the way that we got here, you are more likely to say abortion is fine, it's acceptable means of population control or whatever you want. If you believe there's a creator and a God who creates and gives life, then abortion is obviously murder. So the abortion question is really split down the same lines as the creation evolution question. So is euthanasia, so is mercy killing. The Creationist and evolutionist worldviews are philosophies of life. They are, they really undergird your whole thinking process, your attitude about many things, your reaction to things, uh, is uh, based upon your basic philosophy of life, which is going to be one of these two in some form or another. There are a variety of evolutionists. There are some who say God got involved in the process. God snapped his fingers 20 billion years ago, started it. But there their philosophy of life would be, I think, considerably different than my philosophy of life, which says the Bible is literally true and to be obeyed, to be read carefully and to be obeyed. Has never been disproven scientifically. Archaeology, archaeology has never found anything wrong with the Bible. Nobody's ever been able to prove the world is more than 10,000 years old. You can't prove that scientifically. And I think I gave you some scientific evidence that say it can't be billions of years old. If I told you this room was 900 years old, it would be easy to prove I am wrong. Even though probably none of you saw this room getting built, you could prove it was not 900 years old because there's electricity built into the walls. They didn't have electricity until 100 years ago. So you could then falsify what I said, that the world's billions of, that this room is 900 years old. That's easy to falsify. I think it's easy to falsify the time element <coughs> of evolution. I think it is also easy to falsify the idea that life comes from non-life. Ultimately, the evolutionist has to believe in spontaneous generation in some form or another. There is no way out of that corner. You have to believe that dirt became life at some point. And yet it's never been observed. It's been tried in the laboratory. Last time I was here, one of the students said, well, Mr. Hoven, what would you say if scientists could create life in the laboratory? And I said, that would prove it takes intelligence to make life, which is what the creationist has been saying all along. Even if Miller did make life, and he did not, all he made was a few simple amino acids, and he got some right-handed and some left-handed, equal number of each, and life is all one way, not both ways. And all, amino acid is a far cry from life. T the analogy, the difference between an amino acid that Miller made, one amino acid, the difference between on the back of a giant duck that flew down here from some planet. Well, the kids could see, that's dumb. But if you want to teach that, then let's teach that. If there's 30 different varieties of creation accounts, well, then teach all 30. Why have we only included this one? 
the textbooks will say, second grade books. I got one, uh, it's been packed away, but I, I got sure. second grade books. Oh, yeah, Boys and girls, dinosaurs roamed the earth 70 million years ago. It'll say that like it's a fact. In the second grade books. I'm okay. Also, what about the second grade books? Right. Say it should say scientists believe that. Yeah, they it, say should say, it should say, one theory is that dinosaurs roamed the earth millions of years ago. Another theory, which more than half of the U.S. population believes, more than half of the people believe that dinosaurs did not roam the earth millions of years ago, that they've always been with man, and there may be a few still around. But, but, but the population is still, there's a, I mean, that doesn't make it so. Believing does not make it so. I agree for evolution also. That's right. So why do we only teach this? Why does the second grade book say dinosaurs roamed the earth 70 million years ago when it may indeed not be true? But don't you think that they should be taught in two different subjects instead of in the same classroom? I, mean, I, I think evolution, evolution is not part of science. This is part of a philosophy. But it's been, it's been stirred in with science to the point where people think it belongs there. And the same analogy could be made where beer is always advertised at football games. Right? Beer has nothing to do with football. Show me what beer has to do with football. Or any sporting event. We'd be in real trouble, We'd be in real trouble if we limited ourselves to teaching only those things that we knew everything about. I mean, we couldn't, uh, nobody no knows how sperm time. fertilize eggs. No one knows how that really works. Like you said yourself, no one knows, and I know this to be true because I did some engineering, but no one knows what electricity is. Right. We have to teach people something about electricity. We sure. can't just leave it out because we don't know it all. So so you should, yeah, you've got to you've gotta start somewhere and say, you decide for yourself. If you're a sixth grader and somebody says dinosaurs roamed the earth 70 million years ago, like you said before, kids aren't stupid. Some kids are going to say, well, wait a minute. How do these rocks get this way? How did this happen? How did that happen? If they believe it and it becomes their belief system, well, maybe they'll become geologists. But if not, they won't. I mean, I just don't see this monolithic plot to, to change people's lives with this thing that doesn't even really exist. I mean, you're not even describing evolution properly, let alone... Oh, wait, wait, wait. What have I described about evolution that is improper? You're claiming that, it's a, that, it, that it has this, this coherent view. You get three evolutionists in a room at any one time, and you'll have three different theories of evolution. Yeah, so, and they each can prove the other two are wrong. Well, that's right. So there is no monolithic view where they all say this or they all say that or all say Same with books say that. Oh, yeah, you <laughs> get three Christians in a room, too. The only one that's right is me. Now, that's been proven over and over. Okay. Um, you know, that's my only problem. Is that it's really it's a strong man. You build this book, no. and then you shoot it again. And it's just not the case. I think that we would have to go back to our definition of evolution. Is it microevolution? Then everybody agrees with that. As far as the macro theory of evolution, that this process started 20 billion years ago, this is the way it is presented. This is not scientifically supported. It is not supported by, common, by, by consensus of the American people. Most people do not believe this. Majority opinion doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean it's not true, though. Okay, hold it now. What you just said, listen now. The world population doesn't have a consensus for the existence of your Christian God, but that doesn't Absolutely. mean it doesn't exist. So what kind of but you watch the arguments on creation evolution, and inevitably, some evolutionist will say, but the majority of scientists believe this. Scientists, they're not the public. Doesn't they, they, oh, they, scientists are some, are they infallible? They, no, but there are people who study the thing that have an opinion. The average person in the population doesn't know squat about evolution. That's why your average drug dealer that you're blaming evolutionary theory on isn't going to say, yeah, I'm selling crack cocaine <laughs> because I believe that evolution gives me the right to do this. He's not going to say that, that, that Sidney Huxley or, or, or Darwin supports the theory of survival of the fittest. That's why I'm going to gun you down with a boozy. I mean, that's just maybe that's ridiculous. I, the, it goes back to your philosophical worldview. There's two things we haven't covered that we've been asked to cover here. Carbon dating. And I forgot the other one already, but we only got seven minutes left, so we'll have to hurry. Uh, the, the what? Dendrochronology. Dendrochronology. Okay, we'll get into car carbon dating. Kind of will include that, if we can cover it as quickly here. Radioactive elements, and there are seven or ten of them. I don't know how many exactly, but uh, we're going to take some of the simple ones. Carbon-14 is radioactive. Carbon-14 is formed in the upper atmosphere. The Earth has a layer of air around it, approximately 200 miles thick. <coughs> it floats around all the time, it varies, but about 200 miles thick. Skip the details, I'm going to call it 200 miles. When sunlight or starlight or radiation strikes the atmosphere, it adds excess energy to some of the molecules. Nitrogen can take on extra particles and become carbon-14. Carbon-14 then is radioactive, it's very unstable. You can walk past it with a Geiger counter and you hear click, 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 click as particles fly off. It is falling apart. It falls apart. They watched it for three days in the laboratory and decided that it falls apart. About half of it will fall apart. The half-life is about 5,730 years, which I have on my chart. Half-life of C14 is about 5,730 years. That is based on a three or four day extrapolation, which may, I'm not going to argue with that. That's probably correct. 
But you'll find people that say it's 6,000, some say it's 5,690, you know, it floats around, but approximately 6,000 years for the half-life of carbon. Then, that carbon-14 that is produced in the atmosphere gets mixed in with the other gases, and it ends up hooking up to oxygen, becoming CO2, carbon dioxide. Well, plants breathe carbon dioxide, and they make it part of their tissue. And then an animal eats the plants. All the while, this carbon is falling apart. It's radioactive. Now, carbon-14 is very rare. There is only 0.00076.5% C14. <coughs> Extremely rare. One part per billion. Not much out there. So the animal eats that plant. The animal dies. Today, the atmospheric carbon is about 16 beats, 16 clicks per minute per gram on your Geiger counter. If you start with pure carbon-14, a, a pure gram of carbon-14, your Geiger counter would pick up about 16 clicks per minute. All right? 5,730 years later, you're only going to be getting eight clicks per minute because half of it fell apart. Turn back to stable elements, okay? So if you're only getting eight clicks per minute, you could assume it is 5,730 years old. That's the way it works. If you're only getting four clicks per minute, it has gone through two half-lives. And at four clicks per minute, it is now 11,000 or 12,000 years old. It has only been verified back to 4,000 or 5,000 years based on samples taken from tree rings and samples taken from mummies and parchments and things like that. But it's a far cry from consistent. The dots go all over the chart. From this little bitty 5,000 year range, they have extrapolated back a long time, which may be true. But it is totally overlooking some very fundamental assumptions. The Earth has a magnetic field around it. That magnetic field is responsible for deflecting radiation to the poles. That causes the northern lights and the southern lights, the sky lights up, the neon effect, okay? If the magnetic field is getting weaker, then it used to be stronger. If the magnetic field were stronger 5,000 years ago, the less C14 would be formed. So an animal that lived 5,000 years ago started off with only six clicks per minute. That's all that was available. And then 5,000 years later, he's down to three. And we're going to today date him at being 30,000 years old when he's only five. Because you, you have assumed that the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere today is what it has always been. Willard Libby knew full well, he's the one who invented carbon dating, he knew that atmospheric carbon was still increasing. And yet he ignored that data he knew, if you were filling a barrel, if you had a hose, you're filling a barrel. Up the side of the barrel is a bunch of holes. When you get to a certain level, some of it leaks out. You get to a higher level, it's leaking out two holes now, and then three holes. Eventually, you reach a state called equilibrium, where the water goes out as fast as it comes in. They calculated that the amount of C14 being formed would equal the amount being destroyed in about 30,000 years. It would take approximately 30,000 years. If you started with a fresh atmosphere, sunlight shining on it, atmosphere brand new, within 30,000 years, the formation rate and the destruction rate would balance each other. Equilibrium. Every time C14 has been tested in the upper atmosphere, it is found to be increasing. Many folks that study this will say, we are only one third of the way to equilibrium. The atmosphere still isn't equalized. The creationist would say, yeah, that's because it's less than 10,000 years old, which is what we've been saying all along. Carbon dating is very much in favor of creationism, young Earth. The fact that it is still increasing in the atmosphere says we're right. It's not billions of years old. And to date an animal with carbon dating is to assume the uniformitarian process has been going on for billions of years, it's been equalized, and that simply is a false assumption. It is not true. So what they've done, they've developed six other rulers they can use. Because carbon has a half-life of 5,700 years, it's only good for dating objects that are up to 50,000 years old. Therefore, they picked uranium-235. It has a half-life of 713 million years. Yeah, much longer. So, if I took this dinosaur bone to any university, USA, and said, would you please carbon date this? They would say, we couldn't do it, even if it has carbon. Because carbon won't give an old enough number. All of the dating methods, be they carbon, potassium, argon, uranium, lead, rubidium, strontium, all of them are based on the assumption that the geologic column is already correct. The geologic column was developed in the 1830s, long before any radiometric dating was even thought of. The geologic column 
divides Earth up into these different layers. If a layer is, if a bone is found in this layer, it is predetermined that it's going to be about 70 million years old. So which of the dating methods they use, carbon-14, potassium argon, uranium-235, uranium-238, they will decide which method to use based on how old they think it is. They've already decided the range that's right. Even if it contains carbon, they will not carbon date a dinosaur bone. Dinosaur bones have been found that are not even fossilized. They're still bone. That would fit the creationist worldview. After the flood, <coughs> things would fossilize at different rates. In a coal mine in Australia, a petrified hat was found, dropped by a coal miner. I've seen petrified firewood, chop marks on the end. Like I held one in my hand three weeks ago, a guy in Alabama. Wood can fossilize in 20 or 30 years. Petrified fence posts have been found, put in by farmers in Iowa. I saw part of a petrified pallet from a pallet shop. A mudslide covered it up 30 years ago, fossilized in 30 years. It depends on the conditions. If it's in dry, sandy soil, it may never fossilize. So the fossilization rate is very predictable based on the flood. And, but the, all of the dating methods are based on the faulty assumption that the geologic column is correct. And it's a hoax. But this is the Bible to the evolutionist. This is their Bible. Everything must match the geologic column. If, if, I, got, if I talk somebody into carbon dating this, it would give a date of 10 or 15 or 20,000 years. They would not accept that date because it doesn't fit the preconceived idea. They would select which method to use based on their first assumption. And then if they tested it with uranium and found it to be only 10 million years old, that would be rejected because it doesn't fit the geologic column. They may have to test the sample 10 times to get a number that fits their pattern. 19,000 out of 21,000 carbon dates were rejected because they were called extraneous dates. They didn't fit the pattern. Those of you that believe that you can prove the world's billions of years old by carbon dating do not understand carbon dating. I do debates at universities all the time. The professors will always say, yep, he's right. We can't prove the age of anything by any dating method. It's all circular reasoning based on assumptions. All the assumptions are listed on this page. Seven assumptions. I only covered two. Any one of them would discredit it. It's not useless. I mean, it's a neat tool to use for some things. If you already know the approximate age, it's not useless, but it's overblown. You can't prove this world's billions of years old. Our time is up. This has been great. Any questions, I will send you a book. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. We hope you've enjoyed watching this debate on the topic of creation evolution. This is not just an academic subject. Uh, if the creation story is right and God created this world, then we better do what God says. And if you're watching this tape and you're not a Christian, God loves you. He wants you to come to heaven, but He hates your sin. He hates my sin. He won't tolerate any sin in heaven. Since He created the world and He designed it and He owns it, He makes the rules. And His rule is no sin in heaven. Well, we're all sinners which means we all deserve to go to hell, but Jesus Christ, God himself in the flesh, died on the cross to pay for your sins and my sins. On February 9, 1969, I prayed and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Would you please forgive me and save me? And on that day, I got born again into God's family. You can be born again. All you need to do is admit you're a sinner. Admit that you deserve to go to hell. Call upon Jesus Christ to forgive you and save you. He's the only one who can, and he wants to so badly if you'll just ask Him. If you're not sure you're going to heaven, ask the Lord to save you right now. You could just pray a simple prayer like I prayed back in 1969. I just said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Would you please forgive me and save me right now? If you do that, today will be your spiritual birthday. The Bible says you must be born again in John chapter 3. In John chapter 1, it says you get born again. You become a son of God by receiving Him. When you receive Jesus Christ, you receive His gift that He died on the cross for you and you receive that for your sins, that's the day you get born into God's family. You become God's child. We have lots of material in our ministry designed to help strengthen your faith in the Word of God and help you grow as a Christian. If you'd like to call or write our office, we'd be glad to send you a catalog. You can get on our website and get lots of information. If you'd like to schedule a debate, I'd be honored to come. Just get my itinerary off my website and find out when I will be in your area. And I'll be glad to come speak at a college, speak at a university, speak at uh, a debate represent the creation side against as many professors as want to get together. We'll take on ten at a time. That doesn't matter. You see, God's right and evolution is wrong. It's pretty simple. Thank you so much. Please don't hesitate to call us if we can be any help. 
Do you want to know more about how to combat the godless theory of evolution? Creation Science Evangelism offers four great tools that help strengthen the faith of believers and win the lost to Christ. After 15 years of teaching high school science, Dr. Hoven began Creation Science Evangelism in 1989. We are a ministry that is dedicated to providing tools which will help you combat the evolution philosophy that is destroying the faith of millions every year. The first tool Creation Science offers is their powerful, life-changing video series. Over the last 12 years, well over a million videotapes of Dr. Hoven's seminar have circled the globe. They are reaping a harvest of souls for the kingdom of Christ, as well as helping restore the faith of many thousands confused by the evolution propaganda to which they've been subjected. These videos are available in English, Russian, French, Spanish, Japanese, and sign language. The Age of the Earth, first of the seven-part series, teaches that God created the universe about 6,000 years ago in six literal days. Could this be true? Can it be scientifically proven that the Earth is not billions of years old? This tape gives solid scientific evidence that the Earth is young and that the Bible is scientifically accurate. How did the environment of the original creation differ from ours today? And how would this allow men to live over 900 years? Can Christians have a good explanation for the existence of dinosaurs? Could some dinosaurs still be alive today? These and many more questions are covered in the second and third part of the series. Evolution has permeated public school textbooks with false and fraudulent information. This video exposes nearly 30 lies commonly found in textbooks. Every public school student, teacher, and school board member needs to watch part four of this series. Find out if you have been lied to in your textbooks. Discover the terrible difference evolutionary beliefs have made in the past as well as in recent history in our video number five. Dictators throughout time have used their evolution-based philosophies to rationalize their brutal actions. Learn how evolution propaganda is being used today to prepare people for the new world order. This is just a taste of all the information the 17-hour seminar series has to offer. Also available are college courses that expand on the seminars in great detail. For those who can handle a more confrontational atmosphere, our debate series is just for you. I said, now, Mr. Patterson, if you think the tailbone is a vestigial, I, Kent Hovind, will pay to have yours removed. Dr. Hovind has debated a wide range of atheists and evolutionists all over the country. And you're sure to find these 12 debates very exciting. These would be perfect to present to that scientifically minded person who likes to argue their point. Our topical series includes exciting topics like why evolution is stupid, public school presentation, children's video about dinosaurs, the Bible and health, Leviathan, the fire breathing dragon, and many more. Creation Science also offers a variety of visuals like the longevity chart which presents the entire lineage of Adam to Joseph as given in Genesis. It's exciting to see exactly how many generations were alive at the same time. Hundreds of books on a variety of subjects, videos on incredible creatures that defy evolution, t-shirts, fossils, and more. Make Creation Science Evangelism the one-stop shopping center for your creation material needs. Our two websites, www.drdino.com and www.dinosauradventureland.com, provide our second tool for evangelism. drdino.com is packed with lots of information, from charts and graphs to articles and frequently asked questions. This is also where you will find more information on all of the products CSE has to offer. dinosauradventureland.com is great for the kids. They can play lots of fun games and see unusual rides and activities located at Dinosaur Adventureland in Pensacola, Florida. Thousands visit our sites regularly to gain insight into God's creation. The third tool available to you is the live seminars conducted by Dr. Hovind and his son Eric. Since 1989, Dr. Hovind has held seminars and debates in hundreds of churches, schools, and universities in 49 states and 30 foreign countries. His fast-paced, illustrated seminars cover diverse topics, such as evidence for a young earth, how long Adam lived, dinosaurs living with man, where races came from, radiometric dating, and much more. Our fourth tool is the new, exciting Dinosaur Adventureland. Many thousands have come from all across America to visit our museum, creation bookstore, science center, and theme park. 
where God gets the glory for science. Our unusual swings, rides, and activities each have a science lesson as well as a spiritual lesson. Captivate everyone from age 4 to 94. To order material, find out how to schedule a seminar at your church, or get more information about Dinosaur Adventureland, write to us at Creation Science Evangelism, 29 Cummings Road, Pensacola, Florida, 32503, or call us at 850-479-3466, or toll free in the U.S., 877-479-3466.